Okay, yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, okay, let me see. Thanks, Eric. All right, okay. Uh, we, wait, did I? Okay, um, let's get started. Well, uh, thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, today, um, we're going to be doing a tutorial on build tests. And um, it's going to be um, it's going to be a, a full day session um, with a lot of uh, hopefully hands on material. So um, we're going to get started. And let's see. So um, for this tutorial, um, we have uh, the slides are going to be available in uh, the um, build test uh, documentation site. Um, I'll point out where they are, uh, but if you want, you can click and get to this. Um, maybe I, let me just show you that. So if you go over here, um, all the way to the right, you can uh, download the PowerPoint or the PDF copy. And that should give you uh, access to the content. Um, the next thing that we would want to, wait. Um, yeah, the next thing that I'd like you to do is um, please join the Build Test Slack channel. Um, you can click on this link right here. And it will send you um, autom uh, automatic invite to the Slack channel. And then please navigate to the tutorials channel. And that's where uh, you can post all your questions uh, during the session. So please uh, do that um, as we get started. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we're going to be doing the tutorial on nurse system. So we'll provide you the training accounts. Um, so, so the next thing, um, this is pretty important. Um, if you, um, if you go to iris.nurse.gov, um, you put in this training code DWJW in this top field, and then just fill out the, you know, just fill out this form and then it will give you, um, your username and password. Um, you're going to get one screen uh, with the credentials. Um, so please save your password because once you close the window, you won't be able to access your password. So just please save it like in your uh, password vault or something like that. Okay. So um, I think, uh, okay, yeah. So once you get the training account, uh, what you would want to do is SSH into the um, um, Perlmutter. The user account is going to be like train um, some three digit. So like my training account is train 545, put in the password and then you log in. Okay. Um, if you if you have a Linux system, it should be relatively simple. You just open up a terminal client, type SSH. If you have Windows, then you could use something like PuTTY or Mobax Term um, or whatever uh, you prefer, and uh, then access the cluster that way. Um, just some tips when you're posting messages in Slack, um, please don't use. Uh, like at here um, that sends the message to everyone. Um, if you're gonna paste uh, console output, uh, please use code block. So in Slack, there is this little icon right here. If you do that, that would give you a code block. It's in gray section. And if you, um, it, when you're troubleshooting errors, um, please keep the error message in a thread. So just reply in the thread, that would be helpful in uh, troubleshooting errors. 
and uh, obviously just be a good citizen to help out your colleagues. So uh, if somebody else faces a problem and you uh, you know how to fix it, just please help them out. Okay, maybe I should stop here. Um, so that way, I guess everyone can um, try to catch up to speed. So uh, this is that form right here that you need to fill out. So please do that. And in the meantime, I should expect most of you are joining the Slack channel. So please do that too. Um, yeah, we don't. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, I guess if every one of you um, can please try to follow along. If you have any questions, um, please speak up. So once you get access to Slack, I think everything will make a lot more sense. Yep, I will. Thanks. Okay, um, I see 
couple of people, I think one person joined. Okay, maybe I'm gonna start calling on a couple of people. Um, I guess Maria, Mark, Sarat, are all of you guys able to follow along? Jack. I think Jack joined. Okay. Okay, I see a couple of people joining. That's great. Um, one thing to know, once you fill out the training account, um, it may sometimes take like 15 to 30 minutes until, um, I guess, you get access for some reason. Um, so don't be alarmed if, if the password is like not working. It's just that the system sometimes just takes time to set up the account. <clears throat> um yeah okay well let me um let me move um i guess let's see where we are Um, so I guess for today's agenda, like what we're, what we're going to be talking about um, is um, we'll start off with like a brief introduction to build tests, and then we're going to get into the tutorial. Uh, we'll have a 15 minute break at 1130, followed by um, second part of the tutorial. Um, so in total, we have five hands on tutorial sessions and, um, and then um, the ones in the green are our content and slides that we're going to have. Um, we're going to have also a, a session on how we uh, use build tests at NERSC. Um, so like how you actually uh, can, um, you know, run run tests on an actual HPC facility. And we'll wrap up. Um, hopefully, if we, if we do everything on time, we probably could finish early. But um, let's see. So um, I'm going to just give a brief introduction on build tests um, and um, just tell you what it is. Um, so build test is an open source project. Um, it's a testing framework that helps uh, build and execute tests on your HPC system. Uh, it's intended for um, the HPC staff, developers, um, even end users. And tests are written in YAML, so it's declarative. Um, these tests are called build specs, and it and build tests will process and generate um, basically shell scripts and execute them on your system. It has integration with batch schedulers, so this is um, 
very, very much uh, in line with how HPC systems are, where you typically, um, you know, you run jobs on the compute node. So similarly, when you write tests, you can run them on the on the compute nodes. And, and also you can run them uh, locally on the login node. Uh, the framework is actually implemented in Python 3 and it's available on GitHub. Okay. Um, so some of the design goals, um, so build test is designed to automate uh, test generation and execution. I already mentioned it has integration with uh, like the HPC environment. So not just a batch scheduler, but uh, also modules and for instance, like create programming environment and kind of, um, you know, it helps lower the barrier for writing tests. Um, that's a goal. Um, this is just a preview of build tests. Um, you're going to see a lot of this uh, when we do the tutorial. Um, it is very much command line driven and with lots of commands, I mean, subcommands. So, um, you know, build tests help. It just shows you all the options and then, you know, uh, we'll briefly cover over um, several of these commands as we do the tutorial. Okay. So a general pipeline um, for our build test um, will um, um, takes these build specs. What they do is first, uh, it will discover these build specs based on a search criteria. Uh, this criteria could be like a file or directory or tags or executor. Um, remember that build specs are your uh, tests that you write. And next, all these um, discovered build specs, it's um, validated through a JSON schema. This is done in the parse stage. So um, this is very important because in order for build types to generate a shell script, the YAML file has to be um, valid. Otherwise, um, it doesn't make sense to um, parse this YAML file. Um, so just having the correct YAML uh, structure and then also validating the JSON schema is, uh, is crucial. Uh, the build is the actual core of um, the pipeline uh, where it actually generates a valid shell script from the YAML. And then um, upon uh, creation of the shell script in the run stage, uh, what build test will do is ex actually execute those tests. It determines whether the test needs to be run locally or on a batch uh, executor and retrieves the return code, get the output and error file. And upon completion of the test and uh, build test performs a sanity check, so for instance, um, what this does is it tries to determine if the test is going to be a pass or a fail. And a sanity check uh, is something that can be configured um, in the build, build spec um, based on your preference. And we'll learn about that. Um, there's many ways of doing sanity check. And finally, uh, build test will update all the tests into a report file. It basically captures all the test results into uh, um, into this one flat JSON file. Okay, so in the um, in the previous slide, we talked about how it discovers build specs. This just shows your diagram. Um, so um, build tests can search by files, um, if and also by directory. So if it's a directory, it basically traverses basically all the .yaml files. Um, uh, the build spec has to be in the .yaml. That's just a naming convention that we had. Um, so .yml, uh, that's the only extension uh, that we use. And um, you can also search by tags and executors. We'll also learn about those. But uh, for those, it, it actually reads from a cache. Um, and what it does is after it discovers all those uh, build specs, it will try to basically, it's basically a list that gets um, concatenated together. Uh, you can also exclude build specs. 
uh, and then it's merged together into all the build specs that are going to be used. Um, so um, the exclude actually works on a file or directory too. Um, in the parse stage, what actually happens is we let's say we have this one example um, test right here, build spec. Um, every um, uh, build spec has to get validated with a JSON schema. Um, what you what you want to take away from this is that there is a JSON schema used to validate the test, and um, there is one uh, schema that is this global schema that's just used to validate the the top level content, um, and then in the in each uh, test section, like right now the the test it's called hello world. There is a, a special property called type. It's like a lookup to another schema. So for instance, if you say type is script, there is another schema used to validate this section. And we're gonna learn a little bit about the, the different schemas. Uh, we'll talk about the script compiler and SPAC schema. Basically each of these schemas have their own ways of writing tests. Uh, on the left, you can actually see um, this kind of like a schema definition of the global schema. It says that the required properties are version and build specs. Uh, actually, this uh, may be a little typo, but it's actually just build specs now. So like this top level key, which just says build specs, that is a required property uh, for validating the, uh, the global schema. So you might be wondering, what does this typical build look like? Um, we're gonna learn about this uh, in the hands-on tutorial, but um, build test build is what you use to build a test. Um, when you run it, you're gonna get all this pretty output, all color, um, which is nice. Um, it will show you this uh, summary of basically your system uh, details, like the username, the host name, um, and all this other um, uh, metadata. Uh, it will show you the discovered build spec. So um, basically it will show you, um, you know, all the build specs that were discovered, how many were excluded, um, detection after exclusion. Then it will try to parse the build specs. It would extract out the, uh, the name of the test. Um, and then it's gonna try to build the test. Uh, you will see the uh, how build test is showing you the the directory path where it's going to create this test, the stage directory, and then um, it's going to write the build script. And then afterwards, it will actually run the test. Um, you will see that um, it's like somewhere here in the middle. You see uh, this bash command. This is used to actually run the test. It'll show you the uh, runtime, return code, and then finally the summary of the test. Okay. All right. So I think that wraps it up. And uh, we're going to go into the tutorial. So I think some of you joined a little late. Um, I want to do a quick check and see how you guys are doing in terms of training accounts and um, access to Slack. Can you please speak up if any of you have issues? Um, okay, you did not get the Slack invite. Okay. Um, okay, this is the Slack invitation. I'm going to show you where this is. 
I can't log into Perlmutter yet. Um, it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, just, um, I guess for any of you that actually have a NERSC account, um, you can, you can use your NERSC account if, if you, if you feel comfortable using that as opposed to having a training account. Um, I guess, um, does, does share you, did, did you get the Slack invite? No, not yet, but maybe it's an Outlook problem. Outlook was having some problems. Uh, just continue on, that's fine. Okay. I guess if it, if it, if it still doesn't work, um, maybe you could type in the email and in the chat and I can just kind of invite you annually. I don't know. How are the rest of you guys doing? Um, I still see several of you haven't joined Slack. Um, Maria and Nigel and Sarat, were you able to get access to Slack? Okay, so I need now. Um, this is what you should look like when you actually SSH into uh, Perlmutter. So, so you yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Um, was any of you um, able to uh, access the system yet? Okay, I see. Okay, I see a couple of people have been able to log in. Um, I think we should try to get started. Um, note that most of this you should be able to do um, self-paced. So I think the first the first thing that we're going to do is um, basically install BuildPass, and and it is pretty simple. It's just a Git clone of the project, okay? So, um, yeah, so if I were you, um, I would open up the build test documentation. Um, I'm putting it in the chat and navigate to the um, installing build tests. And in order to install build tests, um, we're gonna need Python 3.7. Um, so let's first clone build test. So I'm just going to do this. And we're going to use the develop branch. Um, yeah. So um, in order to uh, use, um, so you need Python 3.7. So let's see what the version we have. I believe the the system default is 3615. Um, so this is not going to work, but there is a Python uh, module here. So you could use this one. Like that. And then, you know, you go into build pass. And yeah, so you have a preference. If you if you like to use virtual environment, uh, you can create one and just basically copy these steps. If you like Conda, you can use this. If you like PipM, then you can use this. Uh, I'm going to use virtual environment because it's pretty simple. I'm going to create a virtual environment in my home. Uh, .pym build test like this. Oh, yes, I don't have. Uh, it looks like I already have one. Okay. Yeah, it looks like I already have one, I guess. Yeah, I already have one. Um, so I have a Python 3.9. And then the next thing that you need to do is source the setup script in the top level build test um, project. This just basically um, adds build tests into your path. If all goes well, you we should be able to see help.
so far um, so good. Um, if you're a little behind, um, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, so long as you can follow this part of the documentation, um, should be good. Okay. Um, if you do get stuck, please post your questions in the tutorials and um, yeah, we'll be able to help you out. Okay. Um, so for this, for this tutorial, the first session that we're going to do, we're going to try and see how much we can get done is we'll do the command line tutorial for build tests. And most of this you can probably do just by copy paste. And um, yeah. Okay. So let's talk about how you build tests. Um, so build test build is the command used to uh, to run uh, a test. Uh, given a build spec. So if you like, if you look at the build test build help, you're going to see a lot of options. And, and, you know, you can, you can see all the options and what they do. And the first example that we're going to do is, is run um, this one, build test, build test, B. Um, build test root is just uh, the root of build test. So yeah, um, this is what you should see in the output when you run a test. Uh, this is the one that I shared, um, this hello world example. You show uh, this one valid build spec. It will show you the name of the test. Uh, every test has a unique identifier. Um, you recall um, every test has a different type use for validating the, let's say, uh, the test for the schema. So this type is using script. Um, it tells you even the brief description of the test and then kind of um, all the things that go along with building and then running the test. Okay, and then finally at the end, you see the, the total pass and fail along with a log, uh, log file. Um, and then um, update, and then all the tests gets published to uh, a report file. So this is report.json, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. The next one that we're going to do is we're going to try to do um, uh, build by file and by directory. Okay. So I'm going to do the same thing and add build test root general test configuration. Um, yeah, so the output is going to be a little long, but I guess what, what I wanted to show you is that uh, with a directory, it will traverse and show all the build specs that were found. So you see that there is a uh, total of five build specs. That, this was the one that we ran previously, and then we had four more. Okay. Um, other things that you can do is uh, you can use dash X to exclude. So let's say you want to do something like this, where you want to exclude one file, uh, ulimits.yaml. Now, what you will see is 
uh, right here, this file gets excluded. And during the discover, it's, it's going to find all the files, traverse them. And after exclusion, there's a total of three build specs. And then there's um, from those three tests, there's only these ones that got run. Okay. Um, now, let's say what happens if you were going to run and kind of like do the same directory and then exclude the same thing. Uh, in general, um, oops, wait, what happened? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you run um, something and you don't have any build specs, then it will just terminate um, because there's no build specs to process. Uh, that's what you would see typically um, if you were to do any selection and exclusion, and there's nothing. Uh, or if you're trying to do a build test build on some directory and there's no YAML files, then this is what you would expect to see. Okay. Um, next, we're going to talk about a uh, timeout feature. So I'm going to run this one example. It's basically a simple test that will just sleep for two seconds. Okay. Um, the timeout is an option that allows you to terminate a test if it exceeds some time limit. Let's say you're running some tests on an HPC system and you don't want um, tests to run you know, indefinitely. So the timeout could be used. So let's say if you want to run this for timeout for one, se one second, um, what will happen is this test will fail. Uh, build test will send a signal to terminate the process. And now you see uh, some non-zero return code. OK? Uh, now I'll just run this with five seconds. Um, but since this job was going to only sleep for two seconds, it will, you know, nothing happens there. Um, but if there was other tests that take more than two seconds, they would also get you know, terminated. OK? Um, yeah. I guess just doing a quick check, um, or is anyone stuck in getting access? Um, if not, just please post your questions in, um, in the Slack channel. If, if none of you have access to Slack, then please post it here in the Zoom chat. Okay, um, next we'll talk about how you build by tag names. So a tag name is just a keyword um, used to group test. Um, so in previous, we, we specified the full path um, to files, but let's say you don't wanna do that. You just wanna say, hey, I wanna run all, let's say Python test. Um, you can do this with either dash tag or lowercase or, or dash T short option. And let's just try that. So what happens is um, build test will show all the build specs that get discovered by the tag name. Uh, there were two and, and then it runs them right here. OK? <laughs> so uh, next, we'll talk about how you query the test uh, report. So um, build test report 
is the command that you use to query tests and um, you can do uh, help to see all the options. So let's say if you want to find the full path to the report file that's being used, you can do report app. And this will show you the, the, the report file. Uh, if you want to look at this JSON file, um, you know, it's, you know, you can just open it up. Uh, it, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be kind of hard to process um, the data. So if you want to see, so um, build tests um, has an option called, uh, top level option called report. So you can do like build test, uh, like double dash report, name to a report file, and then do build. And then it will write the, uh, the test in a different report file. Okay. Um, so let's, so if you were to do a report list, uh, right now, there's just only one report file. Um, but let, let's let's just try one. So let's say I do, I'm going to put one in temp, uh, temp Python dash T Python. I'll just call it like this. Um, build. Just to show you an example. And now if I were to do report list, uh, no, you see right there, writing two test results to this file. If you do report list, it will show you all the report files. Okay. Yeah, I see a couple of you are joining. That's, that's good. Okay. All right. Um, next, we'll talk about. So let's actually query the test because that's that's going to be useful. So if you do a build test report, uh, you're going to see all the test results that get um, uh, that will run. Uh, in the report file. It will show you the name of the test along with the state, the return code, and all sorts of um, things like start time, end time, run time, um, all this stuff. So we're going to briefly talk, uh, talk about some of these. So let's say you want to find all Uh, oh, uh, another cool thing is, uh, so build test has alias. So build test RT is an alias for report. Um, and, you know, still accepts the same option. So let's say if you want to find all failed tests, you can say double dash fail. And now you see all the failed tests. Uh, the fail is indicated by the state option, uh, state property. So in this column, you see all the failed tests, right? Um, if you want to do pass, uh, just say double dash pass. And now you see all the pass tests. Okay. Let's say you want to find all failed tests and you want to know a total count. So you can use the row count option and it's just going to give you uh, basically the total number of row counts. And this can work with any uh, query. So let's say you want to find all failed counts. Uh, there's five. OK. Um, build test also supports paging. So you know when you're looking at this output of build test report, you're going to go through all of this scrolling and that's that's you know sometimes it's too much so pager will um show it to in paginated mode and now you can basically scroll up and down and see the output and then when you're done you can just press q 
and get out of it. Okay, next we're gonna talk about how you do filters. Uh, filters are done through double dash filter and it accepts a key value pair. And uh, you can also format the columns. So the columns of the, the table that you see here. So let's try running this one example where I'm going to filter by tags equals Python uh, and I'll format by name ID and tags. And now what happens is you see there's only two tests. The, the format is comma separated fields of the table. And depending on the order that you put it in, it's going to render the table that way. And if you want to know about more about the filter fields and the format fields, you could just run these two commands. All right. Um, next, we'll talk about how you inspect tests. So uh, inspecting is more uh, querying a specific test. Right now, we we're just querying the report file. So if you do um, inspect with a help, there is Um, Eric, uh, could you speak up? Uh, is this question, who can see the status of the test? So the, the question yeah. is, is yeah. Um, for the status, when you were talking about the statuses of the status of the test, is that something that can only be seen by the user running the test or is, you know, or is it more global where other people can see it too? Thank you. Um, yeah, the, the test status is, is local to the user. I mean, unless if the report file is shared across uh, everyone, um then yeah anyone can query the status the the status of the test like what you're seeing here so um like this report file is like the one that is being read it's it's actually local to the build test phone but let's say um let's say if it was being used in this um in the context of like um like the report file was written in like a shared um, project space, then anyone can just point to the location and, and then they could see all the test results. Okay. Um, all right, yeah, I, I see you have a problem. Um, so, there will be some coverage of C dash later, which covers um, yeah what, what's that actual publication of the test results for general consumption. Um, I see that some of you make sure that when you have loaded, you have loaded Python 3.9, there is this module. Um, just so that I, I want to show you that this works for everyone. I'll do it quickly. Okay, I'm logged into Perlmutter. Um, I'm going to load Python. Then I'm going to go to build packs. Um, well, assuming you already have the virtual environment created, uh, you could also do Conda, whatever you, whatever you prefer. Activate. And then assuming you have phone build tests, source setup script. 
Okay, in the pip list, you should see um, you should see a lot of the packages already getting installed. Um, like rich is like one of the dependencies, JSON schema. And now you should be able to get the help. Um, just make sure that the version of Python is 3.9. Assuming you've done this correctly. Okay. Mm, let's go to the inspect. Okay. All right, so let's do inspect a list. Um, this is going to show you all the names of the of the test that you ran. Um, the name of the test, the unique identifier. So the unique ID is actually like a 32 digit long identifier. Uh, and then also the corresponding build spec. Um, you can see the, um, so uh, you can, uh, these tests are actually referred as builders. Uh, the builder is in the format of name slash ID. So um, if you do this, basically you take this name and this ID. So the convention of how you query tests is, um, you know, you got you got to know the unique identifier because you know uh, every test could be run multiple times, and you need to be able to query the the run the exact the run that you want. So for the first example, what we we'll do is we're going to inspect uh, these two tests. So hello world and circle area, and we should have both of these tests run from our previous example. Okay, so we're going to use uh, inspect name. And the positional arguments are just the name of the test. And this is what um, the, let me make this a little bit bigger. This is what the content will look like. It will show you the, um, the name of the test, the ID, the full ID, and all of this metadata, like for instance, where the root of the test was, uh, along with the start time, the end time, uh, even the command that was run. Uh, it, yeah. And then this is the hello world. So if you have multiple test runs, uh, it will get all obviously appended into the right dictionary. And, and yeah, it, it, it has the output and the error content in here too. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about um, build test inspect query. This is the command that probably my most used command when I need to run some test and, and and query the test in a human readable format. So what we're going to do is let, let's do a help first. So the inspect query expects a positional argument, which is the name of the builder, the builder being the name of the test, uh, or it could also be the uh, ID. Uh, you can query and print the output error file content of the test. Uh, so we'll do that. IT query dash O dash E dash T hello world. Okay. So uh, in the top, you're going to uh, see the metadata all right here, um, along with the output file, the error and the content of the test, okay? And the nice thing is that if you if you were to like disable one of these options, um, it, it will get rid of whatever content. So this is just coming right from the, the content of the test and just printing it out all right there, okay? Um, let's say you want to retrieve paths to like a given test. Uh, you can use build test path. And it will give you the location of where the test is. 
Um, you know, it, by default, it will show you the root of the test, uh, the root of the test directory. Uh, let's say you want to know where the output file is. You can use the dash O, and now it will show you the output file, right? Or, or the dash E, which is the error file, right? So if you were to go in and like navigate to this directory, you know, what you will see. You know, what you'll see is typically the error, the output, the shell script, and then the uh, the build script. Um, and then there is a stage directory where the tests are. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. I hope... Um, you guys are able to follow along uh, with the tutorial. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, please post your questions in the Slack. Okay, uh, the next thing we'll talk about is how you interact with build specs. So we're gonna talk about, um, uh, I guess one thing I wanna talk about is that there is a command called build test help. Um, you can use build test help with any subcommand um, that you are familiar with, like build, build spec, uh, report, and it will give you a summary of every subcommand in a kind of like a table format, gives you a brief description of what each command does. Um, so it's like a kind of, you could think of it like a, it's like a, it's like a help command for build test. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about how you're going to query uh, the, I guess first what we'll do is we're going to, uh, we're going to rebuild the cache. So build spec find, uh, let me just run this. Uh, when you rebuild the cache, it's going to go and clear this JSON file and load all the build specs based on these two directories and then update the file again. The dash Q is quiet, so it just suppresses the output. Now, if you run find again, it's gonna show you all the tests that are loaded into the cache. Um, and yeah, you'll see the name, the type, the executor. Uh, think of this um, as what are your tests available for you to run? In your HPC system, you'll be writing your own tests. And you know um, you have this build spec cache where you can just kind of see what's available. And now we're going to show you how you query uh, this cache. Um, there is a bunch of options in here that we'll talk about. Um, let's say you want to find all the available tags. Remember the tags used to build? Uh, you can do that with dash T, right? So if you do dash T, it will show you all the available tags, OK? Like this is the one that we ran before. Um, if you want to filter, use the double dash filter and it uses the same thing that we talked about in the previous section with the build test report, you just key value pair. So now you only see test by the tag names uh, filtered by Python. Uh, format works the same way as build test report. You can format the uh, columns. And now you see, in this case, I'm only going to format by name, tags, and description. And, and it just renders the table that way. OK. Uh, another useful command is the build spec summary. Uh, this just summarizes the whole cache for me. It's a, it's a 
it's a pretty big output, but um, I guess it's it's worth just just showing you what it is. Um, it it shows you all the valid build specs, all the invalid build specs, the number of unique tags, the maintainers. It gives you a breakdown by tag names. So you know when you're kind of thinking like, okay, how many tests do I have by each tag names? You can find that out. It breaks down by maintainers. So you we talk about you can assign maintainers to test. It gives you a breakdown by executors. It shows you all the invalid build specs. So basically invalid means that they just failed to validate by the JSON schema. And then it gives you a breakdown by build spec. A build spec is a file. Uh, a file can have um, one or more test section in there. So um, the name of the test are being written here, like right here, here's one that has two tests. Over here, we have three tests. So it shows you all of that stuff here too. Pretty useful command. It summarizes everything in one command, uh, the whole cache. Okay. So next we'll talk about the build test. Uh, so BC is short for build spec. And we talked about find. Uh, all of the aliases are here. Um, you can see them. So uh, we'll do uh, validate and show you the help. So um, the build spec validate, what it is, it's a command used to validate build specs. And it works similar to build test build, uh, at least in terms of options. So it has a dash B, dash X, dash E, and dash T. So um, let's say you wanna you wanna run this. Uh, it will validate every single build spec. And, and one thing you're, you're gonna notice is there's a lot of colors. Um, we intentionally use the uh, the color green for pass and then red for fail. Um, you can, um, what this command I'm just showing you is that we did one by file and one by directory. If you do by directory, it traverses all the files in the directory. Um, we can do it by tag name. Um, and now you see it's there. Uh, one thing I I should tell you right now is that build test has tab completion. So let's say you didn't know what the tag name you wanted to use. Just press tab and now you should see the tag name. Right? So uh, that that that's really helpful. Um it it, it works with uh, most commands. So Use tab to help uh, fill in a lot of the options. Okay, so let's actually try to validate one of the build specs that is actually invalid. So now you see what you should expect. Um, I had a typo. There. Um, if you have a test that is invalid, it will tell you, um, like here, the name of the test says unable to find an executor, bad executor, and it is expecting one of these executors. Uh, this is what the error from the JSON schema is. So now you have to go in and fix it. Um, so this is what how the validation works. Um, now we'll talk about another command. Um, this is called um, show. Uh, it's a sub command within build spec, which will show the contents of the test, uh, given a test name. So let's see. 
let's say you want to show the content of the test sleep in hello world. Uh, now this is actual content of the build spec. Build test knows uh, the name of the test and find the appropriate build spec, and then it will just cat that file for you. And so with this example, what we're trying to show is that we can do positional arguments and have as many test names that you want to show at the same time. Um, so yeah. So now let's say you you are colorblind or you don't prefer uh, certain colors. Uh, we have color themes supported through Rich. Rich is a Python library that is basically used extensively throughout build tests where you see all of these colors, um, right? Um, let's show you the themes. So if you do dash T, or let's do help first. So uh, dash T or double dash theme. Um, we're using all the, the themes that are available by Rich. Um, and if we do tab completion, you have all these different themes. So let's say you want to use Emacs as a theme and you want to show the sleep. Now it's like this, right? Um, you can change it to another one. Um, I don't know, BIM. And now it's like that. So, so yeah, you got you got um, you got a bunch of themes that you can use to to print content out. Have fun. <laughs> um, okay, so let's show you how you can find invalid build specs. So if you want to find invalid, um, you can use the build spec find invalid. And now it will show you the name of all the build specs and then the exceptions that were raised. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, next, we're going to talk about how you configure build tests. And I uh, just the build test configuration, I think we're going to be done. Um, so, uh, for this tutorial, um, we're not going to cover how you configure build tests, but we'll talk about how you can query the configuration file, let's say. So build test config is a command that you use, and um, it has different, sub, uh, different options. So let's say you want to know the full path to the configuration file. You can just say config path. And um, this is the file that is the default build test configuration file that's being used when you clone build test. Um, it's settings uh, slash config.yaml. Um, build test CG is an alias for build test config. Um, so yeah, so let's say you want to view the configuration file. There is the configuration file right there. Um, just like with view, you have themes and you have paging output. So let's say you want to page and see the output, you can page it right here. And then you can quit out. Um, yeah, so uh, in the configuration, uh, in the configuration, um, maybe let me just show you a little bit. The configuration has uh, these executors that are defined. These executors are what's used to actually run the test. So um, you can query these executors, um, like this line 17 to 30. This is the executor definition. Uh, we're, we're defining local executors like bash, sh, csh, defining the shell name. Uh, the description is just metadata. Um, if we were to do config or cg executors, uh, this tells you all the available executors that are 
um, available based on the configuration file. You can query this in JSON like this or in YAML. And this is what you will notice you see in the output of uh, like most of the build specs that it's going to use one of these uh, executors, right? Let's let's say we go in and show sleeve. You see right here this executor, generic local bash. This is using one of these executors defined from the configuration file. That's why this this test was being run based on the executor. Um, so yeah, I think that this concludes our first part of the session. I think we finished uh, about 12 minutes early. So we'll give a little bit of time for you to catch up and until the next session. I think we're gonna have a break at 12.30. I hope, yeah. Yeah, we will start at 11.45. Uh, Maria, were you uh, able to set up your Python environment? Uh, yes, I, I screenshot what you typed and I just follow those uh, commands exactly. Um, and it, it worked, but That's yeah, great. I have a lot of catch up to do. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How is everyone else doing? Hi, Suzanne. I think, um, um, Then do you have access to Slack and the slides? You just joined. And uh, okay. Well, um, I guess if you if you guys want, uh, we could take the break now, and and then in the next section we're gonna go into the build spec tutorial. Uh, if you need time to catch up, um, please feel free to go through this command line tutorial. And I guess we could meet back in like twelve thirty five. So. At least we will be a little bit ahead in schedule. That's okay with everyone? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. So. Let's see if I can pause the recording. Let me see. Um, okay. Um, Suzanne, were you, um, I know you just joined. Do you, were you able to register for an account? Um, I just, uh, joined Slack and I'm able to access the tutorial. Uh, so let me know how, uh, if you have a link or something to create an account, just let me know how to do that. Yeah, um, can you look at the slide? Uh, there's slide number three, gives you the registration form. Uh, here, I'll put the link to the form in the Slack. 
Pagka-receive mo. Yeah. Okay. I'll do that. Thank you. Yes. So, I'll ask you for training card. One. Excuse me? Yeah, it will take about 15 to 20 minutes for you to hopefully um, be able to get access. So just save your password and credentials and then you can SSH into, um, into the system. Okay. Um, since you're... Um, yeah, since you're a little behind, I think you still should be able to do most of the hands-on that you will still have. Okay. So, so don't worry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, let's get started. So for this part of the tutorial, uh, we're going to uh, talk about the, um, the build spec and tutorial on how you actually write um, your test. So this is going to be broken up into, um, uh, I guess, a few topics uh, that we'll cover over uh, this session. Um, the first thing we'll talk about is the uh, kind of the overview of how the build specs are defined. So this is going to be a little bit of a uh, kind of uh, example-based uh, driven uh, with build specs. And, uh, you know, we're going to show, let's say, dummy examples that you would find. Um, so what is a build spec? Uh, build spec is basically a YAML file. Um, you know, it's validated with the schema and it, it basically generates a shell script. So the global schema we talked about, it's the file that uses to validate the kind of the top level structure. And this is kind of an example of build spec. We're just gonna just, um, you know, build spec, this is the top level key that we define. And then this is the name of the test. And then there are some properties that we define like the type executor, uh, the description, the tags, and then the variables that we can define, and then the run sections, what we can use to define what, what we want to run. Okay. Um, the, the type in this section, we're going to talk about the type schema, the type script. So what this is, is going to use the script schema to validate this test. Um, one thing to note is that this run section, which is used basically for you to kind of write whatever uh, arbitrary code you want in Linux, um, you can have it, um, like if it's just like a single command, you can just do this. But if you want to do like a multi-line command, you can just put the pipe symbol and then type your whole um, kind of test that you want um, as here. And this is just kind of like verbatim um, 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 test that will just get copied as as the test gets generated. Okay. Um, so then the name of the test that you see here, like system D default target, um, this is validated by the the schema, and typically the names of the test is basically any any letter from A to Z, you can also have zero to nine. Um, so yeah. And I think there is also a limit to the length of the, the test. I believe it's 48 characters. Okay. Um, the other things that you can define is that, um, so in the configuration file, we talked about different executors. So the name of the executor is typically, um, I guess the format is the name of the system type and then the name of the executor. So in the top level um, configuration, there is a system property and 
like the name of the system is generic. Um, you, if you're on your HPC system, you would just name it to whatever, like we could have named this Perl motor. Um, and then the, the type of the executor could be local or slurm or whatever. Um, we're going to talk more about this. And then the next, like if you want to use bash, it would be this. So it would be system dot type dot name. So when you see generic local bash, the name of the system is generic. The type is a type of the executor. And then this is the name of the actual executor name. Uh, the description is just metadata that you see in the test that gets shown in several of the um, commands. But this is limited to 80 characters, but you can also have a summary, which is a text that could be multi-line and exceed 80 characters. So, so yeah. Um, okay. So I guess our first example that, that I'll show is um, how you declare environment variables. So you can declare environment variables through env. And um, let's say first name and last name, and you can reference these environment variables um, afterwards uh, in your run section. Um, you can also use a um, property like shell to change how you want the, uh, the run section to operate. So when you say, I want to use the bin CSH, you can, uh, you can write CSH commands. Um, like this, or, you know, the, even the path, you can do that. Um, so I guess if you were, so I guess this is the example that is in tutorials environment. This is this example right here. Um, so, you know, if you were to run this example, you're going to see um you know you could like so i guess let's try to refresh some of the things that we we have learned you know you can use build test inspect query and you know you can use dash t like this and now it will show you the content of the test it's putting the export for the environment variables, and then the run section gets put in there. Um, variables are defined using the bars key. And um, yeah, you can have things like single quotes or double quotes. Um, I, I believe in YAML, um, if you put a, a if you're doing um, in YAML, it's a little picky, but if you if you if you want to es escape the single quotes or double quotes, um, then the quotes get put into the string. Um, yeah, um, you can also um, you know use uh, kind of a shell expansion if you want. Um, so if you're defining a variable that, let's say, who am I or whatever, you can you can do this. Uh, or yeah, run a whole command like this, like number of files. Um, so yeah. So I guess if we were to to run this command, tutorials, bars, demo, yeah, and then we could do. IT query variables bash. So now you see all of this here. You see the double quotes, the current user number of files. I guess there's no files in the home directory. That length. So there's stuff like this. Um, so we'll talk about how you define tags. Um, 
remember that you can use build test build double dash tags and then the name of the tag name. Well, in order for you to do that, uh, in the build spec, you can just say the tags as a property of the test. And it could be a string or it could be a list. It, and then you can have multiple tag names, right? Um, <clears throat> the tag names cannot have duplicates. Um, so if you're trying to do something like network, network, that would not work. Okay. Um, yeah. So now we'll talk about um, test status. So in build test, there is different ways for, uh, uh, so th the status of the test is always a pass or a fail. And the default is that if there's no status check, then we're just gonna assume the, you know, we're just gonna rely on the return code. And if it's a zero, it's a pass, everything else is a fail. However, build test has many ways of checking status. And we're gonna cover some of them in the tutorial and some of them um, in the slides. Um, but you know, if you're interested, um, yeah, you can take a look at some of them, but one of them is return code matching. Uh, you can also do runtime, regular expression. Uh, we'll talk about performance check uh, and also file checks. So here's an example of uh, one that is uh, return code matching. Um, yeah, we have this example right here where we have four tests. This test is going to fail with an exit one. This test is going to basically run the same thing above, but we're going to do a matching on return code one. Uh, this one just showing you that um, you can have a list of return codes. And you know, we're going to have an exit two, but then this one not going to work. And then now this is just showing you that you can also have a single return code. Okay. So this example is actually in um, tutorials, test status, I think past return code. Yeah. So if you take a look at this in the output, um, you're going to see. This exit one pass, you see how it's, it's showing you right here, it's checking the return code and it's matching in the list. Same over here, 128. Um, yeah. And then like you can see over here, are the ones that failed. This one just failed because it's just an exit one. It's just showing you what a failure would look like. And then this one's a mismatch. So because we got a two, but we're, we're expecting a one or a three. Uh, that's actually right there. Um, some things about return codes, um, you can have an empty list and you can have floating points. And you can't have duplicates. What might is the list? Okay. Um, next, we'll talk about how you pass tests based on regular expression on, let's say, the output or error file. So we have an example right here where we're going to just to echo um, regex pass. Well, let me just show this example. Yeah. So um, this status property that we're going to show, um, this status is a dictionary, or I mean a key value pair, and it's got a lot of options and. Uh, right now, we just we just in in this last last section, we just talked about return code. Now we're talking about regex, and there's going to be other options that we're going to have in here. The regex can take um, 
the expression, the regular expression that's denoted by um, exp. Uh, that's a subproperty of the regex field. And then the stream is the um, output or error stream, which is either standard out or standard error. So what we should expect to see is if we just say echo path, we should see this message in standard out. And we're going to do an express a regular expression, basically checking if this uh, this word exists in the in the file. And the same thing in this one, we're going to do fail. And we're going to expect to see, but we're going to try to do a, a start with a line of one, two, three, fail. Uh, so we shouldn't see this working. So, so here we see performing regular expression right here. This one failed. And this one was a success. Now let's actually try to query these things. Let's make sure that we can get this. So I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this. I'm going to do the output of both of them. You see this is the output right there. This is the output over here. So this one passed, obviously, and the other one failed because it was going to expect uh, the output to start with a one, two, three. So what build test does is actually opens up the entire file and applies a regular expression and see if there is a match. If there isn't, then it um, then it just terminates. I mean, it, it just it it finds no match and then it it it's a failure. Um, you can also pass tests based on runtime. So we have this example where, um, so runtime is a property within status. This is the third option that we're talking about where you can define a minimum and a maximum time. We have this one example, which is just gonna sleep uh, for two seconds. And then we're gonna have this runtime for one to three seconds. Basically uh, this test will pass if the runtime is be between one and three. Uh, if the runtime is um, just specified with the minimum, then the test will exceed the, sorry, the test will only pass if it exceeds the minimum time. And likewise with maximum is that if only maximum is specified, then the test will pass if it's within the maximum time. So what we should expect to see is these first three tests are gonna pass. We're gonna expect to see this sleep for two seconds. And obviously it's it's exceeding the minimum and two is also less than five. These two are gonna fail. Uh, we're expecting a minimum of 10 seconds for this test to run, but we're only gonna sleep for two seconds. And then this one is sleeping for three seconds, but we're expecting a maximum runtime of one second. Okay. So you can run this by like this. So let me ex expand this screen so you can see it a little bit. But um, please try to also run it so you can kind of follow along in the exercise. You can see that we're checking the minimum time um with the runtime so this is the runtime that we get and then all of these other ones get set right here and yeah so like this one also passed right here that's this one with the a24 uh that's this one and then these ones failed because you know this is seven two Yeah, right here, two seconds, but it was less. Um, the minimum time was 10 seconds. So that one failed. And likewise, this 7C2. Oh, yeah, that's 7C2. Oh, this one, this one's the maximum time. So that one failed because the maximum time 
was supposed to be three seconds, but it, it was one second here. Sorry, the maximum time was supposed to be one second, but it's not for three seconds. So, um, so yeah, you can use this as a as a way if you want to pass test based on runtime. Uh, and sometimes, if you just want to explicitly declare the test status, uh, you can just just override it and just say state is pass or fail. Uh, state is just another property. Um, so like this is just an example uh, where we're just going to say, um, we're going to return to exit one, which by default is a failure. But if you say state is passed, it will, the, we will expect to see this will pass. And then this one is going to always fail. Just to show you that we can set the status fail, even though we have an exit of zero. Normally, if you didn't have this, this would also pass. Um, and then in this example, what we're showing is that uh, this test will fail even if we do have a return code match, because we're doing an exit one. The state property still um, kind of takes precedence. And likewise, even if there is a mismatch, and we have this pass, it will still pass. So just, so if, if the state property is used with other things, it would take precedence is what I'm trying to say. So let's try running this test. I think it's this one. And yeah, this is what you should see. You should see this one is gonna fail. Even though it has a zero return code, it's because of the state. This always pass is gonna fail, even though you see this return code one. And these other two, yeah, this one had a mismatch because, but it still passed because of this thing right here. Okay. Um, the other thing that we wanna talk about next is that build test can perform file checks as a means for passing tests. So what a file check is, is um, you can check file existence. So the first property that I talk about is exists with an S and it's a list of files or directory names to check. So let's say you are writing some output file uh, or directory and you wanna make sure that they exist. In this um, example, we're gonna have two different tests. Um, note that variable expansion is also supported. So what you should expect to see is that, um, yeah, this test is gonna pass because we're, we're creating a directory called dir a uh, temp abc, and then we touch file one. Um, and then this one, we're gonna expect to see this failure because so um, hopefully we don't have a directory called bar uh, when we create this. So, so yeah, so let's try running this. And if you see, <laughs> um, build test will show you the checks that are being run. Uh, you see bar does not exist. So this exist check is a failure or basically um, this is a Boolean. So it's just like true or false. And, and, then, and then in here, the first one, uh, we're checking all of these and then it's, saying, oh yeah, this one exists, this one exists, this one exists, and then, yeah, and then this one exists, this file one. Uh, note that if you put in uh, uh, 
pill test uh, uses uh, if it's a relative file path, then it's um, then it is local to the state directory where the test is uh, actually run from. So the root of the the test under stage is where the actual test, um, let's say stage directory is going to come in. So um, in the in the file existence check, um, every file is checked. If there is any failure, then the test fails. And the existence is basically just checking if, you know, in Python, it's like os.path.exists. You can think of it that way. It's just um, file existence. Okay. Um, so here's another example. Let's say you, you want to test um, directory name one. Um, this is going to fail. Let's say um, you can do validate test status file exists exception. This is just to show you an example of, of how um, you can go about with, let's say directories that are, I mean, if you wanna go about with uh, checking for directories that are like numeric base, um, you know, if you just put like one like this, that's not gonna work. Uh, you have to put it in quotes. Because you see uh, the exception says that one is not a type string. It's expecting a, a property of type string uh, in the field. So if you were to run the same test with quotes, then it will work. Um, yeah, so I think we have this example file exists with number. Yeah, so I have this example uh, right here in this test and we're just gonna just run this. Well, let's actually validate this, make sure that it works. Yeah, you see now this this test is valid, and then we're gonna build it. And now it works. Uh, this one is actually this directory right here. Let's see, you can um, you can confirm that it's actually is a directory, um, oops, yeah. Okay, so the next check that we'll talk about is the uh, is directory and is file check. Um, it's also a property within status. So let's say instead of just doing file existence, you want to actually check, hey, is this a directory or a file, or whatever. Um, you can also combine multiple status properties. So everything that you've learned in the past, um, you can also group them all together and each check is uh, performed separately. So in this example, we're gonna check, uh, we're gonna expect to see, uh, so home is a directory obviously, same with temp, but home.bashrc is a file. So we should expect to see this one is going to fail. And basically the second test is doing the same thing and just making the test pass. Um, we're just introducing the is file and putting the home.bashrc over here. So we can run this test by 
by doing this. And now if you see this test, um, right here, um, this directory existence check failed because home.bashrc is not a directory. And then in the other one, it passed because all the, uh, so over here, uh, this is a file. So that's how um, is directory in his file check works. Okay, um, next we'll talk about um, skip. Um, so right now, what we uh, what we have shown is that it, build tests will typically run all the tests in the build spec. Um, but if you want to skip a test, you can use a skip equals yes or skip equals no. Uh, but you know, skip equals no is probably useless because it's by default, it's going to run anyways, if you don't even define it. So, so you can use skip equals yes. Um, so yeah, so I think um, you can also use um, true and false as values. So it's just uh, Boolean. Um, so yes or no also works, I think. So um, let me show you this example. Yeah, so this is that yes and no. And um, yeah. So right here, if you look, uh, with this, you see this test skip got skipped because of the skip property. And now it's only running one test. Now, if you wanna skip an entire build spec, uh, you can put skip on the top of the, uh, of the file name, like, you know, at the same level as build specs. And what it will do is it will skip all the tests. Um, you know, it, 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 this is just to show you that even if you don't have any skip, it, this test will get skipped. And then even if you have skip equals no, it won't matter. This test is also skipped because th this skip will just skip the whole thing. Um, so, So what, what happens is when you when you skip, when you only specify one file and there's no test to process, you're gonna you're gonna get this error. It's not an error, it's just that it's just giving you a message that it can't process any test. Um but you know th this is the message that says that you know skipping all tests because the skip is defined. Um, so yeah, so if you were to like do it with something else, like tutorials, large.yaml, obviously then you're gonna get one test to run, but this other test will get skipped. So yeah. Um, okay. Trying to keep that of time, so. I have 111. Okay, so we're probably a, a much ahead, which is good. Um, so um, I, right now we're in part two of the tutorial. Um, I actually try to do um, one of the other parts and then we'll do lunch and then we'll do part three of the tutorial um, after lunch. Yes, let's do 111.
I guess I'll, I'll, I'll do a quick uh, check um, and see how you guys are doing uh, in this session. Do you guys have any questions? Okay, that's great. Okay. Um, so why well, I'm um, just thinking that we can do the spec integration uh, one after lunch, and I do the compiler one right now. Okay. Is that okay with you, Wyatt? Okay. Um, for this part of the tutorial, um, there's going to be a little bit of extra setup, but um, I guess if you want to bear with me, um, first of all, under um, this tutorial setup in the build spec tutorial, uh, what I like you to do is uh, so on Perlmutter, we have Podman. And we're going to use that to uh, basically pull in a container in order to run part of this uh, tutorial. So the thing that um, that we would like you to do is the following. And I'm going to try to do this with you so that you can follow along. First is you want to create this stories.com because apparently this is not created for us. Uh, it's used for Podman in order for us to pull in the container uh, to specify the location where the containers are stored. So do mkdir-p and specify this directory path. And then uh, let's just create this file open up this file. Um, and over here, um, just copy this section, what you see in the storage and put in the graph root to something like temp slash your user slash storage. So I've done that like temp and I'm trained 545. Um, and that should be good enough. Next, what you can do is you can pull in the container. Um, you just have to pull it in once and then you can just run the container like this. Okay. So I'm gonna pull in the container. Um, so please, please try this out because, um, if you do get stuck with, if you, if, if you do get stuck on the pod man, it's, it's, it's basically this, this storage configuration. You have to make sure you, you create this. Otherwise you won't be able to pull it in. You're going to get some error. Um, this Podman run is basically going to start up an interactive shell into the container. And since it's a container image, uh, we're going to have to clone build tests inside the container. So uh, to follow along with that part, um, well, let, let me let me just run this first. 
So I'd show you what it looks like. Um, so there you go. So you see my prompt has changed from right here. Um, if I go in and do PWD, I'm in home spec. And, and if I do LS, then I'm in a completely different environment. I'm not in my, in, in my HPC cluster. So, um, so git clone this. CD into build pets, and then source this script. That's all that you need to do. Um, you don't need to module load or anything. It will uh, this setup script will do that for you. If everything goes well, um, you should be able to see build tests in your path. Um, this system has LMOD, so you can do module version and the configuration file is the, that is being used is defined by this environment variable. So you can, you can double check if all of these outputs make sense. Once you're able to do this section, uh, we, we are gonna use the container for the compiler schema and the SPAC uh, integration. So please keep your container alive uh, uh, for this session. And then once we're done, we can just exit out of this container. If at any time you accidentally press exit or control Z or whatever, um, Unfortunately, you will have to rerun the same commands again. Um, so yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, um, please post them in the Slack and I think Wyatt has already posted um, the instructions for this. Thank you. Okay, so last, um, in, in the last uh, session, we, we talked about um, how we were using the script uh, schema for writing tests. Now we're going to talk about the compiler schema. It's basically, uh, uh, it's using a different schema. So you select it with a type colon and then specify compiler. And it's basically used for compilations of, well, let's say, programs, uh, typically like single source files uh, with your compilers that you typically use. Um, so we'll start off with kind of the most basic, you you know, hello, hello world kind of examples. Um, we have an example that we are going to um, have like I said, hello world Fortran. So, so we have this type compiler. Um, the actually let me go over here so the required properties are source so source is the property i mean sorry source is the source code that you want to compile compilers is the uh, uh set is the uh, place where you define the compiler settings and then obviously the type and the executor are uh, are required the type is required in order to en enable this schema. And then the executor is the, the way to determine uh, where the test needs to run. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so the compilers can have things like, uh, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's an object. You can define the, uh, the name, this selects, compilers that you want. And it could be a regular expression on the compilers that are available. Um, we'll talk about the compilers, uh, how you find them. Uh, but what, what you want to know is that we have a compiler name called GCC 750. And you can have a default group for all GCC compilation, let's say for all, like the Fortran flags, uh, you can specify uh, them. And, and then, yeah, we can run this test. 
So let's see. I will show you this example. This is under examples, compilers, in the hello dot Fortran. Okay. So like how we um, uh, talked about before, you can do inspect query dash T hello F. And now uh, this kind of shows you that um, yeah, so this is a compilation. So we have um, this user bin g4tran dash wall. The executable is this, and then this is the source code right there. Okay. Uh, the compilers are actually defined in config compilers. You can go here and you can see the compilers right here. So GCC 750. Sorry, I'm going a little, um, a, a little bit on a tangent, but you you'll kind of understand why this is it's this way. If you take uh, uh, the compilers are defined as a as a group, compiler group, and then this is the name of the compiler, and you're gonna find the compiler wrappers, whatever. Uh, for instance, like um, CC, CXX, FC. If and if if, if if there is no compiler wrapper, like for let's say Clang, then say none. Um, GCC 750, this is our system compiler that we have on there. So um, when we had selected this compiler, that's why this G4 trend came over here. We can also just specify the name and then have module load take care of this too. So basically, um, so what, how built has detects the programming language is basically, it's, uh, based on the source code, uh, the source file uh, file extension, uh, it looks at the file extension, uh, and then it tries to make uh, a guess on the language. So like .c is all C, like .cpp or .cxx or .cc. Like these are C++, and then all the Fortran extensions are here. So it kind of tries to figure that out based on based on this. Um, so yeah, I, I, I kind of just talked about how you search for compilers right here. But let, let's try a different example. Uh, in this example, what we'll do is we'll try to build um, this vector addition example with um, multiple GC, with basically for all the GCC compilers. Uh, this name is basically applying a regular expression on every single compiler in here. And if it matches, then it will pick it up. So let's try this out. Examples, compilers, project, I don't know. Now you see this one test vector addition GNU has uh, this GCC 7, GCC 6, GCC 8 picked up, um, and it's going to do a compilation with each of them. Now, um, let's actually just go in and just show you what it looks like. I'm going to do build test inspect query dash T like this. Now, if you just do dash T, it will show you the test, but it uh, by default, it will only show you the latest test run. So it's, show, it's just showing you one, but there's actually three tests in here. If you put a slash, uh, you can do tab completion and find the unique ID. Uh, if, you, if you just do slash, it will just kind of do all. Think of it like a uh, star. So, um, so here you see the this is the one test with the GCC eight. This is the second test with GCC six five, and then this is the other one that is the you know the user bin GCC. There's no module load. I didn't talk about this in, in the previous one, but um, I guess 
you know, if you do tab completion, you know, you could just put in a few letters, let's say A8, and now it will only show you this specific uh, uh, test run. Okay. All right, um, next we'll talk about, I see there's a few people joined. Um, I guess, well, Maria, you joined. Um, yeah, Maria, can you try to join this, this Slack channel? Here, I'll put it in the, the message again. Um, yeah, please join the Slack channel. There's this, and then the link to the slides are available here. Um, please set, um, please register for the nurse training account. Um, you can find it in the slide. It will take a little bit of time, and then once you're in, then you should be able to do the tutorial. If you have any questions, please, uh, please ask. Um, you can type in chat. Uh, but we prefer if you get on the Slack channel, then you can ask us questions directly there. Okay. Um, next one is um, we can also customize the compiler options. So you can use this config property that can be used to override configuration options for a specific compiler. So you have to name the compiler name uh, in the config section. Um, so the default is applied at the group level of the compiler. Uh, the config, think of it as overriding what the defaults are. So let's say the, the default uh, for compilation of this hello world program is dash 01, but you can do uh, Let's say for GCC5, you want to do dash 02 and then this one dash 03. Um, so I believe this is the example that we have in, in this one. Yeah, that's this example. So we're going to try to run this example. And then we're going to do this inspect query dash t with the trailing um, slash, and that will give you. You'll see this dash o one is the default. This dash o two is for the GCC six five. And the 830 is for the dash 03. Okay. Um. I guess Peter, um, I don't know if I pronounce your name properly, but um, I think you just joined. So if you want to take a look at the pin messages in the Slack, we'll give you access to the slides and also access to how you can connect to Perlmutter. Uh, please fill out the um, registration form um, and then you should be able to do the tutorial. Okay, uh, next we'll talk about how you exclude compilers. So um, 
we talked about the selection of compilers is using the name. The exclude works um, based on the actual name of the compiler that you want. Uh, you can do regular expression, but you can exclude uh, like after detection. So let's say uh, you want to exclude 650 as a compiler. Um, if you run this test, what you'll see is that it's gonna uh, it's gonna discover, but it, it will exclude six five zero. So we can do compiler exclude. Let's So now you see only this one and this one is there. Uh, exclude and it shows you right here this GCC 650 got excluded during the test generation. So uh, with the compiler, um, you can basically do like you can run a single source code and run it across like basically all your compilers if you will think about it. If you have all the GCC compilers, you can do that. And I'm just giving you one example of like a simple vector addition example. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> you can also set up environment variables. Um, so under the defaults, you can do uh, ENV, similar to what we showed in the script. And let's say you, you're doing an uh, uh, op uh, OpenMP example, OpenMP hello world. So uh, typically you need to do something like, you know, OMP num threads. Uh, set that environment variable to the number of threads. And then, you know, use, uh, let's say, dash F open MP. Um, so, so you can set environment variables like this. Um, I believe this example is this one. So I'm going to run this example. And and then we can kind of look at the IT query that show. I'll do output also. So you see the output, hello world from two threads. And over here, you see the export OMP num threads is set. OK. Here is an example where you can override environment variables, um, you know, previously we talked about using the config and you can override, let's say like the flags, but you can also override basically anything that you see in the default. So think of default, uh, basically anything under the compiler group under default can be overrated under the config GCC and then yeah, environment. So, so yeah, let's run this. And then we're going to, yeah, I guess I just do that right this way. So we have two tests here and, no, oh, that didn't work. I'll go like this. Like that. Uh, maybe if you look at this test, you should see this one has two and then this one has four. This is the GCC 830. This is getting overridden right there. And then the, the default is two. Uh, also note in this regular expression, is uh, this is a list of regular expressions. So uh, you can do pretty much anything you want. Um, um, next we'll talk about, you can also tweak how, regular, uh, how tests can pass. So when you talked about status, everything you learned about status is available within the compiler group two. So return code uh, along with regex. 
So that's also available. So in this example, what we have is, um, yeah, so this, this test is gonna pass because um, you know the default return code is a zero uh, and that's what we're expecting. And then in this other one, we're gonna override. I guess the point that we're trying to make here is that the, um, the default return code for all the compilers will use this one, but for GCC 830, it's gonna use specifically this one, this regular expression. So I believe this example is, let's make sure that we have this. Yeah, this is the one, okay. Okay, so if you look at this example right here, um, it's actually um, quite a bit because what we what we have is we have three three tests written with this default status return code, and all of these are passing because they have three return codes of zero. Okay, I hope you're following along. These are the three return code. I mean, these are the first three tests. These are the second three tests from this test right here. Okay, they're all gonna fail because for one, the default is uh, checking for one. So there's a mismatch. You see this one zero is a mismatch uh, and also here. But the other one that is being checked, which is from the, for A30, is checking for the final result, but uh, the regular expression is, the output is gonna give you this. And we can confirm this. Let's do inspect query dash O. Override status regex. So this is the output that we are expecting to see. And that's why the test fails. I hope you understand what is doing here. We're checking basically from this expression, start of this line, final result, ending in this. But this doesn't match. So that's why we have all three failures. Okay. Um, I'm gonna skip this one. Um, another thing, so everything that we learned about at least the compilers part, compilers with an S uh, that does the selection, you can use this with the script schema, the type equals script. So I'm just gonna show you this, where what we're, what we're showing is that we can, um, uh, in this example, we're going to run the stream micro benchmark um, and test basically um, the stream benchmark uh, with all the GCC compilers. We're going to compile it with the dash F open MP dash O2 with environment variables eight. And then what you should see. Let's try running this. Examples, compilers, stream example. You're going to see three tests for stream. This is in the script schema. So you have one test being compiled three times for each compiler. 
Now, one thing that um, that I want to mention is that when you're doing compiler, uh, when you're using this kind of technique with the compilers, build test automatically has predefined variables um, called build test underscore CC, CXX, FFC, basically wrappers to the compilers, C, C++, Fortran, uh, C flags, CXX, and CPP for the C flags, uh, C++ flags. Um, I forgot to mention there's also F flags um, that should, and it's not documented here. Uh, also CPP flags and LD flags. So uh, when you compile, when you when you kind of doing some compilation or whatever, you can do that here. Uh, these these get put in. So let's actually try to show you this. Stream open MP. So here you go. If you look at this, um, all these um, build test star variables, build test underscore variables, um, they get set right here. And they're typically just going to be the compiler wrappers. Uh, the module loads get put in for the appropriate compilers based on the compiler definition. And then obviously the, the content of the run section gets appended right after that. Um, I guess we can stop here. So I, um, I guess I'll stop here and see if you guys have any questions. And uh, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions because I think we are, um, we're basically about a half hour ahead of schedule, which is good. We can get you guys out early if all goes well. I guess question, were you able to set up the container and follow along with this exercise? Um, I, I was able to, <clears throat> uh, to get to the beginning of that part. Um, there's a there's a section in the documentation that says to make sure to update our TMP uh, fi uh, uh, path to our user ID. Not not sure what it that meant, but I just created a directory TMP with my training um, yeah. user ID slash uh, um, spec. I think oh, storage. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Basically, this is just um, just some directory. I uh, I put this in, so you don't copy paste this, but replace this user with. Uh, but I don't believe you have to actually pre-create this directory. Podman will do this. Oh, okay. I misunderstood. Okay, I'll 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 yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you don't even have to worry about the location. It's just that you just have to make sure that this configuration is there and this graph root is basically set to some location. Um, so yeah. And how how long will the account uh, for how long will the account be um, uh, accessible, Shasi? For to the believe... temporal muter, and will mm -hmm. we get a chance to complete the exercise, or will it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I believe that, um you should have access for like another like.
basically till the end of this week, I hope. Um, and yeah, and you should be able to use the same training account. And and if you um, yeah, and you, and if you if you have a nurse account or if you don't, you know, you're welcome to apply. Um, most of the tutorial that we talked about, um, I believe you can actually do all of this on your laptop also. Uh, the only part that we're going to talk about afterwards that you can't do is the tutorial that we do on Perlmutter. That's this section. Oh, I see. Yeah. So most of this you should be able to do even on your laptop. We just did it for this on Perlmutter because we don't know what kind of system they might have. So, you know, people might have Windows, they might have, yeah, whatever, so. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, okay. So I think we're scheduled for break around 1.15 central time. So that's about, Yes, about 27 or no, 13, uh, 25 minutes away. Um, do you guys want to take lunch break right now and we meet back? Or if you want, I mean, we could do one of the, um, the sessions right now and then take the lunch at the right time. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna kind of, um, I suspect this would happen. Um, so in the agenda, what we'll do is um, I have, um, um, why it's gonna be doing part three of the tutorial, which is gonna be the, uh, the SPAC integration. We'll do that after lunch, uh, which is what we had scheduled. So uh, we'll do the build test features, which is, going to be a kind of you just relax and just we just going to talk about some of the features that are in the uh, in build tests that weren't covered and then we'll do the promoter tutorial and then we'll just conclude so hopefully after lunch we should be able to get um get you out of here um okay All right, so we'll talk about some of the the, uh, the, the things that um, in build test that you can do. Um, so build test path, this is a command used to retrieve the path. Um, you can use a backslash to specify the unique identifier. So here's an example, you can use build test path, name of the test, and now it gives you the full path to where the test will run. Yeah, if the ID is not specified, it'll fetch the latest run. Um, and then, you know, some of the useful things that you can do is, you know, let's say you want to know the, the content of the test. You can use build test path dash T. And then, you know, you can just do cat on the file. And now you show the content of the file. So you, you can do stuff like that. Um, another th command that we didn't cover in the tutorial, um, but you can you can try this out, is uh, and we can view all builds. This is um, using build test history. So uh, build test history list will show you all the available builds that will run with the build test build command. Um, each build is, um, I don't know, uh, you can query it using the identifier. So it's just incremented every time there's a new build. Um, every build basically gets incremented. Um, the um, So build test will store uh, all of this data. Uh, sorry. So the all, so build test will store all of this in build test 
root var dot history, where each of the um, history file, um, you, you would say these directories, 0, 1, 2, all the way, um, will have um, a build.json, uh, some build tests, some log file, like underscore some unique identifier dot log, and then the output.txt. The output.txt is the output of the build test build. The build.json is the metadata, uh, including all the test results and then the log file. Um, so I'll show you what this looks like. So if you do a build test history query and we query on one of the identifiers, let's say one, and do double dash output, it's gonna show you the output of the test. I mean, sorry, output of the build test build command, like as if you were running that command, but it's just showing you the output. You can query, sorry. Yeah, if you query um, without any options, you're gonna see the whole, all the metadata. This includes the build details, the, the discovered build specs, the summary of the tests. So, in, so basically this is showing you if you look over here, uh, well, I guess it's, it's hard to tell. Um, but if, if I were to go and you know how I show you the output of like one of this stuff right here, where it's showing you the total pass and the fail. Well, that's what this is showing you, the test summary with the pass and the fail, the pass rate, fail rate. And then the builders is the kind of, um, you know, the name of the builder this unique ID, the name of the test, um, and all the metadata for each test right here, the output error file. Um, build tests can automate uh, testing of your compilers. It can also find compilers. Um, so we talked about how we use the compilers uh, property to search compilers. Um, Compilers are uh, defining your configuration file, but you can also use uh, build test config compilers find, which will automatically find compilers based on uh, like your modules. And you know, if I run this command here on the left, uh, you can see from in this section highlighted in yellow. Um, if there is a module corresponding to one of the compilers like GCC, it will automatically generate this section. Uh, the way we do this is build test uses a, a Python API called L module. It's basically, uh, it, it was a, it's an extension to build test. Uh, it used to be a feature and then we created a separate project, which basically uses L mod to find modules and you can also use it to test. So you can do something like build test config compilers test. And what it will do is it will test every single compiler to make sure that you can basically test the compiler by doing a module load operation. And if it fails, it would also show you the failures. Okay. Um, build test supports test dependency. Uh, so we didn't talk about this um, in the tutorial, but just wanted to briefly mention that it does, we do have support for it. The way it works is you use needs. Um, and this is a pretty simple uh, three example, job A, B, and C, where job A has no dependencies. Job B has a dependency uh, on job A. So needs is a list. And um, job C has a dependency on job A and job B. What happens is um, when build test uh, runs these tests with test dependency, it's gonna um, it's gonna it's gonna make sure that job A is run. It completes, meaning it finishes the test until job B is run. Um, if there's no test dependency, then all the tests just get run um, at the same time. Okay, you can also do test dependency by 
state, and even also return code. So this is a pretty, um, let's say, um, where is this? Yeah. Um, so the needs property, since it's a list, you can specify um, attributes for the test. So let's say right here, um, fail test depends on past tests, which is the first test, but it, it depends, uh, uh, it, it will only depend if the state is pass. And we're gonna expect the past test is gonna uh, pass. That's why we set this, sorry. Uh, so fail test will run. Pass and fail test has two dependencies. It has a dependency on pass test and fail test for, for basically these two attributes. And then the final test has a dependency on the previous three tests. Now let's say you don't care about a particular attribute, you can just name the test. So I'm just showing you all the different ways that you can use needs. Um, and then over here, uh, pass and fail tests depends on return code here. So you can use either state or return code, uh, or if you don't care about the actual attribute, you can just name the test. Um, if the test dependency is not matched for whatever reason, then the test is not executed. Um, since, you know, uh, we didn't talk about batch support, but we will talk about it in the in the tutorial, in the promoter tutorial, but build test supports, uh, batch submissions to Slurm, LSF, PBS, and Cobalt. Um, all of our examples that we have shown right now is we were running tests locally on, uh, lo you know, on the local machine using like, you know, Bash uh, or SH uh, executor. But in the configuration file, you can define executors like Slurm. Uh, so this is an example uh, on Cori where we have a Slurm executor for KNL debug. KNL debug is the name of the executor. We're mapping it to the QoS debug and we're specifying Slurm options. We can specify Slurm options into the configuration file. So basically it says that whenever you wanna use this queue, you're gonna specify dash C KNL quad cache. Now in the build spec, you specify the name of the executor, like right here, cori.slurm.kno debug. You can also specify sbatch options. Um, you don't have to specify the, the sbatch directive. You just have to specify the options. Build test will automatically put those uh, directives in the test. And then when you run the test, Build test, what it will do is it will submit the job to the scheduler, like right here, the job ID, pull the job until it's complete. Um, and yeah. Um, I guess I'll skip this one, but we already talked about file checks, but yeah. Oh, um, yeah, and then I guess multi-compiler tests. I, I guess it's just an example, but yeah, we already covered this. Um, in case you didn't know, um, you can support multiple compiler tests and you can specify the, the C flags and environment variables and they get appended into the test. Okay, so one thing that we didn't talk about is with batch submission, you can specify uh, max pen time and also pull interval. So when you're, um, uh, the default uh, interval is I believe 30 seconds uh, to basically, uh, it's pulling the job uh, by querying the scheduler for the job ID and checking the state of the job. So if you say pull interval, um, let's say 15 seconds, it's gonna pull every 15 seconds. And max pen time, what it is, is it's the maximum number of seconds a job could be pending. And once it exceeds that limit, it will 
cancel the job. So uh, you can use this as a way of kind of terminating the uh, build test um, if the job just never finishes in time. So you would see like this example gets stopped because you know after 30 seconds, uh, the job gets terminated. Multiple executors. Um, so far, we had been talking about using the executor property like as if it was just the name of the executor that we can define, like, um, you know, like generic, local, whatever, bash. But in reality, what's going on is that a build test is actually doing a regular expression search for the available compiler, uh, available executors. So if you want to use a regular expression, you need to put it in single quotes. So I have this example where I'm have multi, uh, this test name multiple executors, and you know we have bash and sh, so we should expect to see this test run with both executors. Now this becomes more relevant when you. Um, I mean, this example with you know running across Bash and SH seems silly, but when you when you're doing this in an HPC system, it will make more sense when you're doing it across multiple um, like queues, you know, like in a Slurm queue or whatever. Uh, but an example right here I, I want to show you is that when you're doing with multiple executors, um, you have a property called executors with an S where you can override, let's say different attributes uh, for each test. So let's say uh, you have to name the, uh, the name of the executor that is gonna be selected. And let's say for the, uh, for the bash executor, you want the status check to be zero or two or for the SH is gonna be one. So, um, so we should expect to see this SH executor is going to fail because um, it's uh, going to expect a return code of one. Uh, build test supports coloring. So uh, we talked about, uh, yeah, so it uses Rich, which is the Python library uh, for displaying all this fancy output that you've seen, uh, like colors, tables, even paging. Uh, build test help color is going to show you all the colors that are available. And colors are, um, so the double dash color is the um, option that you can use to specify the colors. And you can use this with things like report or basically any, mostly all commands that have some kind of table output and it will change the colors of the rows. So I'm just running the same build test report with green and cyan. And now you can see these colors changing. Uh, we have several performance check um, for status check. So if you're doing some kind of performance uh, regression test, um, this could be useful. Uh, this is a relatively new feature. Um, but we have uh, several comparison operators like greater, greater, equal, less, less equals, equality, and not equal. Um, so we'll talk about some of them. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can check out this link, which talks about all the performance check. And um, we'll talk about this. This is the stream example uh, that we talked about um, at a, a, in one of the examples. Um, the way performance check or the way um, performance checks usually work is you have to define metrics. And metrics are uh, basically, you can think of them as um, metrics are uh, a name that is assigned some value where you have to typically uh, do a regular expression on either standard out or standard error. The metrics uh, 
Um, so in this case, uh, we have four metrics, copy, scale, add, and triad. Uh, you can define the type of the metric because it's going to store a value. Like, uh, so it could be int or float or a string. Uh, this regex is what you would typically do when you're doing a status check on a regular expression. So uh, we're taking this copy, scale, add, and triad uh, on the standard out screen. Um, and um, item, item is telling, um, it's basically the matching group that you want. So um, that's how you define metrics. But the, the important thing that we're talking about here is the um, in the status, you can use assert GE, which is greater or equal. You can use the name of the metric. So I have copy scale, um, add and triad with different reference values. So I have this output and you can see here, uh, based on these reference values, uh, this test is passing based on uh, the, the stream results. So um, since it's a list of metrics that are being checked, if any of these metrics fail based on the um, greater equal operation, then this uh, check is going to fail. Um, so here is an equality check. Um, here we have basically uh, environment variables x, y, first and last. And we're going to do an equality check on 1, 1 1.5, John and Smith. And we should expect to see all this pass. You can see the output. Uh, the thing with equality check is that we can also do equality check on uh, strings. So if you look on line 29, and 35, first and last are of type string. Uh, X is of type int. So you, so this is just trying to show you that you can have different types of metric in terms of the data type. Um, just some exceptions that can happen with metrics. Um, this is not limited to assert equals, but just in general, when you're defining a name of a metric, um, if you define an invalid metric name, invalid in the sense that it's a metric that's not captured within like the metrics property, then the test is gonna, the check is gonna fail. In this example, you see in the second line, Invalid metrics is not a valid metric because there's only one metric X that is available, right? So, um, so that's not okay. Um, and then in the second example, this is just to show you that, you know, if you do have a mismatch, like here, one is e one is not I'm trying to check if one is equal to two because that's the reference value that we're ex uh, expecting, then it's going to fail. Um, you can also do an assertion based on lower and upper bound. So same example with the, um, um, the stream benchmark. We have the same four metrics. Um, and now um, we're using the property called assert range. And the only difference this has is that it has a um, property called lower and upper that is available, um, it will expect either an int or a float. Um, and these uh, lower and upper bounds are uh, used for comparison. So you can see, I uh, basically set a lower lower bound of like 5,000 and 4,500, 4,300, 5,600, upper bound of basically 20,000. And then the actual result is the one in the middle. That's the actual uh, metrics value that we're getting. And all of these checks passed. And obviously this test may vary uh, depending on where you run this. So, so yeah. Um, 
we also support um, contains and not contains. So let's uh, let's uh, what this is is you can use reference value with a um, uh, sorry you can specify a list of reference values to check. So contains um, is a property within status, and uh, the ref is basically a list. Um, it could be int, it could be float, it could be string. Uh, you can have a mix of whatever you want. So in this example, um, we're checking the metric X to make sure that it, it contains either one, two, four, or eight. Um, in this example, we should expect the X, the variable X is defined one, and we should expect to see this pass. And then not contains is making sure that it, it doesn't include basically the inverse, so two or four. So it's, um, so not contains is also true. Uh, right here, one is not in two and four, so yeah. And then in the second test example, um, I just wanted to show you that it's basically writing the same example. The metrics X is of type int, but the reference is having a single quote one. So it's a string one as opposed to an integer one. So in the list, it's it's not gonna match. If you look at it, the very first line is checking if one is in the, the list. Um, so yeah. Um, so I think we're gonna stop here. And I think this is a perfect time for us to take a break. Um, I guess, do you have any questions on, on the slides that we talked about before we head out? Okay, so um, let's meet back. I think that let's meet back at 2 p.m. Central Time. So I think it's like it says 45 minutes. And in the next session, uh, Wyatt's going to be doing the tutorial on uh, the SPAC integration. So, um, so for that one, um, please do set up the tutorial setup if you haven't. And we're hopefully gonna get this thing uh, going um, after lunch. And if you have any questions, um, you know, please feel free to post uh, in the chat or in the Slack channel and we can help you out. So um, I guess we'll see you in 45 minutes then. Stop the real lot. Thanks. Okay, so um, hopefully everybody's back from lunch. Um, if there are any questions, especially about setting up the container environment, uh, now would be a good time to get those out there because we're gonna be continuing in the container for this portion. And today we're going to be, or at this point, we're going to be talking about um, uh, build test SPAC integration. Um, I'd be, if, if we were live, I'd be asking for a show of hands, but uh, does anyone here um, not know what SPAC is? Uh, okay, just for a, uh, just for a quick review, uh, SPAC is a package uh, management tool focused on um, HPC applications. Uh, but it uh, it basically allows the installation of uh, packages and their uh, and their dependencies. Uh, it's very useful for maintaining software stacks at HPC facilities, um, and it's it's used pretty widely. It's pretty popular, so uh, ho hopefully everybody here has heard of it or maybe even uh, used it on occasion. Um, 
and so because uh, SPAC is uh, used in particular at uh, at NERSC for uh, some of their uh, uh, software deployment, uh, it's uh, it's good to have uh, uh, direct support for that in the uh, testing infrastructure uh, in, in the testing infrastructure and build test. Um, so what we have here uh, is the schema for uh, uh, SPAC oriented build specs, and uh, this will make more sense as we go through. Uh, but basically. Uh, if you're going to create a, a, a SPAC focused build spec, you're going to have a, a type executor and a SPAC entry that will be required in that build spec. So let's go down here to the basics. Um, the the most essential, the most fundamental thing you can do with SPAC is install a thing, and um, and this is this is uh, going to look at what it, what you do to uh, install or to test an installation with SPAC using build test. Um, so if you're doing this on the command line, you would type spac install zlib, assuming that spac has been installed and uh, is set up in your environment so that you can run spac commands. Um, if you specify root in the spac section of your build spec, um, then spac is just going to look for your spac root there. Uh, alternatively, if you leave that blank, um, SPAC, uh, the build test uh, infrastructure will automatically download and uh, set up your uh, its own SPAC install specific for this installation. And so you can see we have our um, build spec boilerplate here. And the actual SPAC commands are specified here. We're just uh, under the install section saying we want to install Zlib. And then if we're cloning SPAC, we just don't specify root, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. So we can open down our um, build test call here and copy this instruction. It'd be nice if I could uh, widen out this screen a little bit so we can see everything at once. That's a little better. All right, and so that runs through pretty quickly. Running tests, writing error file. All right, and there we go. Now, in this example here, I'm seeing three failures, and I'm not sure what the uh, cause of that would be because we're now uh, running in the same container where this has been tested previously. Um, if uh, if Shazez has any uh, insight into what's happening there, he can speak up. But uh, this should work out of the box. Yeah, we might have to take a look at um, what happened there. Yeah. Okay, well, as it happens, our next uh, step is to uh, uh, run this... Uh, query and maybe that will show us a little bit more of what's happening here. So let's see what the generated script actually looks like. So get clone, get clone, be sourced. And in theory, SPAC install Zlib should just work. So I'm just going to see what happens if I run that on the command line. Yeah, just works. Okay, so there's there's something else going on with this test environment, but uh, we can we can dig into that a little bit later on. So the uh, the next element of SPAC to discuss is environments. And so uh, a SPAC environment is sort of a, a self-contained set of software. Um, so you're, you're not uh, you're, you're not loading every single thing that SPAC 
has installed, but a, a subset of those things, and then spec uh, curates that environment so that the uh, the so that just the packages within that environment are loaded and available. So if you if you have uh, uh, multiple development operations happening, you can swap between the environments for those operations by switching between spec environments. And build test uh, includes the uh, ability to uh, define and manipulate those environments uh, within a build spec. In terms of the uh, command line SPAC operations, this would look like uh, SPAC inv create, and the relevant files that define a SPAC environment are SPAC.yaml, which is the uh, user editable YAML file, and then a SPAC.lock file, which contains the concretized results of building a SPAC environment. And then you can turn a SPAC environment on and off by running SPAC inv activate. I ask a quick question. Oh yeah, sure. So like the spec.yaml file, I would copy my own because I'm doing builds of things that aren't in the spec repository. Um, so I have a spec and everything, but can I do other commands besides just the install? Can I wrap that with some shell commands doing copy commands or you know whatever uh, before that? Is, is that part of what a build spec could be here? Uh, so uh, yeah, we're going to get to that in a minute. Seeing some okay. uh, some some pre spec and post spec command operations, I think that the um, that the environment setup commands allow you to specify an external an external spec dot yaml as part of the uh, mm -hmm. as part of the spec section. Uh, but I'll need to uh, I'll need to double check that uh, with uh, with uh, Shazeb. Yeah, it's it's just a little bit down in the docs, but okay, yeah, yes, you yeah, can. We'll, yeah, we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, so another another relevant um, consideration for environments is setting up the uh, the compilers that are available uh, to SPAC because uh, uh, SPAC will try to use um, if, if there are multiple sets of compilers you want SPAC to know which ones to use for its builds in a given environment and um, that's something that uh, uh, that's something that you can also handle uh, within uh, within the uh, uh, build spec. Or if you've already set up your SPAC, uh, your SPAC compilers externally, then uh, then you can skip that step. And then there's an option field for additional options to be sent to uh, SPAC install. All right, so here we can see what's happening. Uh, we're telling we're telling SPAC that we do want it to do compiler find. So if we if we change the environment up here um, and had a different set of compilers available. Um, this would make sure that SPAC would find the uh, the latest compilers when running this build test. We're going to create an environment. Uh, we're going to call it M4Zlib, and this is like a little subset of a SPAC um, of a SPAC environment because it's it's a similar uh, a SPAC environment is a, largely a uh, a YAML list of specs to install. Um, so we're going to uh, create an environment that has these entries. We're going to activate that environment. And we're going to concretize it, and we're going to send the option to keep prefix, which is a, a handy SPAC option that means that after you've built everything, the build files will remain, so those can be introspected on. Um, that's especially useful if you are running into uh, build issues and want to figure out what's going on there yourself. Okay, so let's try running this build spec. All right, yeah, that worked. So you should see uh, similar results to uh, what I have here in my console or in the example output. And then we can inspect and uh, and see what we get back from this query. Right, so the uh, the actual the actual shell script that build spec that build spec ends up executing, um, we source the specified uh, spec installs setup script, and then we're comp doing compiler find. We're uh, creating this environment. We're activating the environment. We're adding a couple specs, and we're concretizing. So. 
So um, this is this is pretty similar uh, to the previous example, but uh, you can also specify a particular location to create an environment. Um, and there are various reasons you might want to do this. In particular, if if you uh, are, are uh, if if you want to have build test build something and have it lying around that uh, you could potentially use manually later on. So we can set this off the same way. And we'll see that the uh, the significant difference here is that the uh, script that build test generates is going to uh, add the uh, dash D option followed by the path that we wanted to use. So we can go down here and inspect that. Yeah, so that's pretty similar, only we're specifying the location where the uh, environment should be created. So this addresses the question that was asked earlier. Um, what if you want to create an environment from a spac.yaml or a spac.lock manifest file? So you can see here under the in section, we're creating an environment and instead, and we're giving it its own name, but we're just specifying the location of a manifest uh, for, for reference. I'm going to cat this real quick so we can see what this, um, what this looks like. Yeah, so this is a pretty simple SPAC environment. Um, it's not a view concretized separately. That's all pretty much boilerplate. And we're just uh, specifying the specs. There's no carriage return at the end. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're just going to be uh, putting in uh, M4, Z, Live, and Python. But obviously, a, a more a more complicated, fancy environment definition um, would uh, operate just the same. Sorry about that. My narrow window is giving me a little bit of trouble here. Okay, so that ran as expected. And now we can go down here and run the associated inspect operation. And there we go. Uh, sourced our SPAC environment, created our environment, um, named it manifest example, and just gave the path to the SPAC.yaml file. So there are some other um, some other environment manipulations that uh, SPAC supports, and uh, those are handled by build test as well. Um, environment removal uh, can be useful for various testing operations. For example, if you want to make sure an environment is removed either before or after testing. And so you can see what we're doing here is we're uh, creating an environment, but we're also saying that we want to remove it automatically. So that means that when you're done, uh, wherever, whatever um, whatever path was set for the location of this environment, it's going to be removed after the fact. Or alternatively, you can explicitly remove an environment uh, by giving the uh, rm command and the name to be removed. Also handy if, for example, you're creating multiple environments and only some of them are going to be valid and worth having around after the fact.
So we can copy that command and run it down here. All right, looks like that worked great. And you can see those two build specs executed as expected. And now let's introspect real quick just to make sure that those uh, those scripts are doing what we think they were doing. Okay, yeah, there we go. And note that uh, a, a lot of the uh, commands that you can issue to SPAC um, require uh, a, a yes, like SPAC will ask for confirmation and build test knows to add dash Y to bypass that so you don't just end up sitting there waiting for keyboard input. So um, this section addresses another question that was asked earlier pertaining to pre and post commands. And uh, these can actually be handy um, in, in non-SPAC build test operations. Um, so essentially, you can have a pre command that will uh, run whatever you want, just like the uh, the standard uh, scripting interface for a uh, for a build test operation, and likewise for post command. So, if you do want to, for example, uh, copy a uh, spac.yaml from a known location into a, a separate area for testing, uh, that this would be the way to handle that. And. Uh, up here in the uh, in the documentation, you can also see a relevant uh, item: verify SPAC false. So, for example, if you're using your pre command to set up SPAC, uh, you can indicate to build spec that you know you've already taken care of it. You don't need build spec to do any of that verification that might otherwise uh, bog things down. All right, so let's copy and run this command and see what happens. Success. I'm still curious why that first set of tests didn't run. Everything else seems to be working. All right, so with that run, we can go down here and uh, copy our query command and see what actually ran in there. And you can see that the uh, generated uh, the, the generated script helpfully puts the pre and post commands in these little comments so you can see what's what's doing what in the uh, generated script. And you can see here the output file included uh, the OS release information, that's what we asked for, and the version of GCC. Then we sourced uh, the SPAC setup script, installed the Zlib, and then we checked our SPAC version after the fact. So this is, this is a pretty simple example, but you can do some very useful and complicated operations with this. We're just, we're just kind of showing off the, the building blocks at this level. So a uh, very useful feature of SPAC is mirrors. Um, and so SPAC uh, allows caching of pre-built binaries. So instead of uh, going through all the rigmarole of actually uh, compiling uh, source for packages, you can just copy binaries from a cache. Um, the uh, uh, E4S, uh, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, uh, provides one a uh, pretty extensive cache of pre-built binaries. Um, and so if you uh, make use of those, then you're just going to copy your executables in and it can make uh, SPAC operations uh, much more, uh, much more um, efficient time-wise. And so you can see here, we're specifying a local mirror And we're going, and we can do that as well in a SPAC environment if we want to. So let's copy this and run this mirror example. Uh, 
All right, looks like that worked. Let's do our query real quick. Oops. All right, so there we go. We're creating our mirror, we're activating our mirror. And then for post commands, we can do our mirror list and we can do blame mirrors. And so that basically tells us which mirror um, operation is providing which set of files. And so um, SPAC, um, uh, SPAC mirror functionality um, isn't uh, isn't terribly complicated, but uh, you know, for uh, if, it's, it's the, if this is the first time that you've encountered it, um, it, it's worth taking a look at the SPAC documentation or their or some of their tutorial content as well, just to uh, uh, get a more complete understanding of what the options are and how to curate that. We're, we're going over this pretty quickly, which is in, in part because uh, build spec makes it. Uh, uh, pretty quick and easy to uh, to handle this, uh, at least in terms of uh, test management. Um, so for build test, a very important SPAC feature is uh, SPAC testing. Uh, packages can, uh, they, they, they don't always, but they can define their own internal test functionality so that when you run uh, SPAC test run and then provide the name of the package to test, um, the test that was defined within the package, within the the uh, essentially the Python file that tells SPAC how to install that particular software, uh, that will run on the installed software and return um, results based on whether the uh, whether the uh, test passed or failed. And so, um, Bell Test is able to uh, manage those test run operations and evaluate the output just just like a regular test. Um, this saves the uh, developer overhead of defining a test from scratch. Uh, it's a lot easier, obviously, if it's already been written by the package maintainer, and um, build tests can just latch onto that. Um, a, uh, <clears throat> a relevant uh, feature of the SPAC test run functionality is dash alias. Normally, when you run a test, um, it will associate the results of that test with a hash. By giving it an alias, you can see an actual name that you've defined for the test, which makes it easier to keep track of what you're looking at. And then after the test has been run, uh, SPAC test results allows you to um, examine the, uh, the results of the test beyond the initial output, for example, seeing a uh, more complete log output. And so you can see here under the SPAC section, you just define test, run, and the name of the spec that you want to run. And then because you uh, because uh, build test is going to define an alias, uh, we know that uh, this is going to be the name of the test suite that was run. And the option dash L tells the uh, SPAC results call that we want to see the full log output. So we're going to see everything that was printed by the, by the uh, SPAC operation instead of just a pass or fail. So let's copy this run and paste that in there and see what happens. All right, it looks like that worked. Let's see what our inspection yeah. has to say. All right, so what we ran here was SPAC test run dash dash alias SPAC test M4 on M4. And so in this case, the name of the alias was generated internally. Um, but yes, I just want to add that it's basically the name of the test that you define in the build spec. Um, right. So yeah, you can use the alias. It, it will automatically set that up for you if you're using results. Um, yeah. Right. And then you can see from our output, um, 
after setting up SPAC, um, the SPAC test run um, initially told us that the run passed successfully, so that worked. And then the uh, results output included the hello world that this particular test for M4 happens to generate. So it's also possible to um, run tests in the context of an environment. And so we're going to see that down here. And uh, oh, in, in this documentation, we're talking about um, how to get uh, spec test results for uh, a spec set. And so you can see what's happening here is we, we're installing libxml, um, we're installing uh, lib uh, sig, uh, sig sig v. We're specifying that we want to remove the tests when we're done so that we don't um, uh, have too many of them uh, left floating, uh, floating around afterward to confuse future evaluation of tests. All right, let's run this and see what happens. All right, looks like that worked. Uh, let's check the generated output. And so in addition to the installation, uh, we should see some test output, but also that the, um, that the tests were removed after, uh, after obtaining the results. Yeah, there we go. So, Quite a few tests were run in this case. Some um, some packages contain multiple internal tests. Uh, also worth noting that uh, if a SPAC test run command covers more than one installed package, uh, it will run all of those. It will run all of those tests. So, if, for example, if you've installed two different versions of a package, um, if you just give the name of that version to SPAC test, um, it might run multiple tests. Uh, however, SPAC test can also be passed a, a hash for an installed package, in which case it will only run, run the test for the matching installation. And you can see what, what happened here. We uh, set up this back environment. We created our um, example environment. We activated that environment. We installed some packages. We removed any existing tests. We ran our tests, and then we got our result output. Uh, what we have here is the opportunity to specify some scheduler directives uh, in a build spec. And so uh, this may be, th this may come up as well in the um, portion of the tutorial where we cover testing on Perlmutter, uh, but you can see that this uh, can be incorporated into running uh, the SPAC tests as well. So this is... Uh, a synthesis of a, a couple different uh, elements of build test for uh, some more more advanced testing environments. So you can see in this case, we're still on generic local bash instead of, for example, a, a storm executor where we might be uh, uh, incorporating more of these S batch elements. And here, here we're installing um, some specs for Zlib uh, a couple of different versions, and we're specifying the use of the uh, Clang compiler. So let's copy that test invocation and uh, kick it off. Uh, you didn't run the test. Oh, wait, yeah, sorry. Yeah. So that was the query. Yeah, I guess it was intentionally that we didn't run it, but okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So this, um, this, this can, yeah. this can wait until the, um, uh, yeah, the, uh, the S batch stuff can wait until the uh, uh, promoter section. I think that's in there. So, yeah. um, so I think that completes the uh, the SPAC portion of our program. Um, the next section covers the uh, build test. E, uh, and E4S test suite integration. So 
Uh, E4S is the extreme scale scientific software stack, and uh, it's got a lot going on. Basically, it, it, it's curating um, uh, over 100 uh, software products that are relevant to um, uh, high performance computing. And it does that largely through management of, and uh, maintenance and testing of, um, of um, SPAC environments. So um, a lot of what E4S produces is uh, SPAC environments, and those are then deployed to uh, different facilities and also containers. The test suite was developed to uh, help with uh, testing these, uh, these packages in these different environments, um, and it's sort of uh, acts in uh, in complement to the uh, uh, to the internal SPAC tests. Um, I, ideally, every every uh, SPAC package would have a uh, a well formed test that could run anywhere. But sometimes a SPAC test uh, doesn't doesn't work as intended on a particular platform, and a lot of SPAC packages don't have internal SPAC tests. So the test suite uh, provides tests for individual packages. Uh, it's uh, driven by a series of shell scripts basically every test has a setup clean compile and run script and then those are managed and the output is handled by a top level driver script uh, i'm not going to go into too much detail on how this works but there are links in the uh, build test tutorial if you want to uh, check out the repository or read additional documentation So build test is uh, using the E4S test suite uh, in some of its uh, ProMutter tests. Um, an example build spec that's uh, uh, set up for just running on the uh, on the container example is available here, and you, you can see what's happening. It's not um, it's not uh, integrated to the point of having a uh, E4S test suite specific schema, but the um, the process for executing it is pretty straightforward. Um, so you, you just specify the uh, uh, the run script portion down here. Um, in this case, we're going to be testing the uh, the in pitch package installed with SPAC. And in, in many cases, uh, this would already be provided by the software environment. So, for example, instead of running SPAC install in pitch, you would just make sure that the modules that provide the SPAC installed in pitch are loaded in the test environment. Um, you clone the test suite. Um, alternatively, if you have a, a static installation of the test suite, you could set that in your environment, but this way you can be sure that you're getting the cleanest and latest version of that test suite. Uh, change to the test suite directory and uh, invoke the uh, test all driver script. Uh, specify the location of the package for the, uh, the location of the test for the package that we want to look at. And here we're going to say, don't bother to print any of the color output uh, that is provided by default from the uh, the test suite, and we want to uh, print the logs to the command output. Uh, by default, the logs are just saved as files uh, that are stored uh, time stamped in the test directory. All right, so let's copy that, copy that and see what happens. All right. So uh, note that uh, because the um, because the binary cache is set up, uh, installing uh, without that installing in pitch could take a while because in pitch uh, well takes a while to build, <laughs> especially if all of its dependencies aren't available. However, uh, this should still run reasonably quickly because instead of building in pitch from scratch, it's obtaining those binaries from the uh, uh, from the binary repository. All right, it looks like that worked. So let's take a look at uh, the query here. Uh, note that we're using the dash E command so that we're seeing the error output as well as the uh, standard uh, standard out output because by default, the, um, uh, the E4S test suite will print the, um, the log output to standard error. All right, let's copy and paste that inspect. All right, and so here you can see from the output file, um, first we're installing um, in pitch, and that's pretty quick and easy. 
And then the error file includes, uh, first of all, checking out the, um, the uh, E4S test suite repo. And so then for under setup, it just verifies that the package is present and loads it. Uh, it cleans the directory, which is empty because we just checked it out. And then it runs the compile phase. And then, and there we see we're just building a few uh, basic MPI, uh, uh, MPI uh, demo files. And then it uh, runs those files and all of them pass successfully. And so, uh, and, and because this was just running the, um, uh, just running a uh, bash script definition in the build spec, um, oops, the uh, contents of the generated test file is pretty much identical to what we have uh, outlined in the build spec. And um, if anybody has any questions about um, the test suite or about E4S, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch with uh, uh, me or any of the E4S crew. And that concludes um, this portion of the tutorial. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop my share. Yes, we can stop if you have any questions before we proceed to the next one. Yeah, there's there was a lot going on there. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks, Why I think. Do you mind spending just uh, thirty seconds or so and, and let me know what's in the E4S test suite? What what does it test? I know oh, there's uh, 6,500 applications in SPAC, but what, you know, so what is E4S basically the test suite? What does it cover in general? Uh, well, here, let me, um, let me uh, bring back, whoops. That was not the right screen. There we go. All right, am I, am I screen scaring the right yes. screen again? Okay, that looks better. Mm -hmm. um, Right, so uh, let me let me show you that. So um, this is the repository for the E4S test suite. Um, at the top level, we have a few different configuration files. Uh, I, I didn't mention that, uh, but that's actually an important element of the E4S test suite um, because you might want to run with S run on one system and MPI run on a, run on another system and specify that you you know want a, a particular um, a particular uh, CUDA arc vari uh, variable for uh, for your uh, um, variance on some on, on one system. You know, th th there's a few things that you need to be able to set depending on where you're running, and it's hard to set those uh, those parameters for uh, an internal SPAC test. So this is one thing that we provide. Like we have, like for example, on uh, um, by default we use the uh, container on SH, which is kind of vanilla Bash on Linux, but then for 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 uh, Cray PE, uh, we set uh, we have our settings here. All of the validation tests um, are provided in this directory. So there's one subdirectory per test, and um, so this is kind of what we're looking at. Uh, the, these are uh, these are uh, the products or some some of the products that are curated by um, by uh, E4S, which is under the auspices of the um, uh, Exascale Computing Program. And so these are uh, largely uh, HPC oriented uh, math and um, uh, utility type applications and some uh, and some computing infrastructure. So you probably yeah, see, yeah, see some, yeah, I see some of the applications I'm involved with out there. So good. Yeah. All right. And so let's see. And, yeah, so the the top level uh, driver script is here, and that basically uh, just it, it iterates through all of whatever whatever subset of these tests are specified by the command line, and uh, and goes to town, so to speak. Um, let's see, where's my other tab? Um, so the other thing to look at is the E4S project itself. 
and uh, this covers uh, documentation and has some uh, nicely uh, uh, cur curated information on all of the products that are supported by E4S, as well as uh, some uh, useful project, uh, some useful uh, products, uh, in including uh, um, a massive binary repository, um, different containers for for different. Uh, uh, for different releases of, of E4S and uh, uh, split up between uh, different uh, architectures um, and with different uh, and with support for different um, accelerators as well. And th that's something that I didn't have time to touch on in the uh, in the E4S test suite segment um, is how we handle uh, tests for for different um, uh, for different accelerators. But uh, when, when the work is done to define the tests, we could have separate uh, tests for the same package that operate on, for example, um, uh, HIP, CUDA, or or the uh, uh, G, uh, CPU implementation of those tests. Um, any other questions about E4S or the um, uh, or the E4S test suite, or does that uh, does that cover? Okay, well, I guess if there isn't any questions, then um, I think uh, we can proceed with the next um, session. All right, um, sounds good. So this is going to be the last um, hands-on tutorial and probably um, this is the session that will be actually um, we're going to be doing it on Perlmutter. Um, just a quick check. Can you? Uh, am I sharing the right screen? Do you see my documentation? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so. If you were following along in the previous part of the tutorial um just um you could just control z or exit out of the container and get back to your um parameter system if you um if you don't have access to parameter uh whatever you can start a new session ssh in to parameter module load python uh clone build tests uh, since i already have this set up i don't have to do this um, I already have, um, uh, let's see. Yeah, I already have build test cloned in my home directory. The, the thing that you want to do is also clone this repository and then run this command. <clears throat> and let's try doing that. So this is going to be, um, mostly a hands-on tutorial uh, where you, you're going to be tasked for doing, I think there's five exercises and there is a solutions file to help you um, kind of um, help you if, you if you get stuck or if you just want to check the answers. So uh, I just ran this, I cloned this, and I and you just set this environment variable, build test config file to uh, this config. And I'll briefly talk about this exercise and then um, just kind of like what you're tasked to do. And I'll, I'll let you um, kind of work through this and then kind of maybe uh, about 10 minutes prior to the session, I'll try to try to give you the solution. So the first example, what you're going to be tasked to do is doing uh, uh, is basically running a batch job. So the first example is this build spec that you have. Um, you can run this by running this command and see the output and you know query the result. And then after that, what I would like you to do is run this on both regular and debug queue. So um, you know, basically, this is the idea of using multiple executors. Uh, you could take a look at this link. And what you should 
try to get is um, this. You should see two tests like this. Okay, and then try to do a build test build once you update the um, build spec. So this is your first example, which would be about batch job. Actually, let me just yeah go like this. So it's easier. Um, the second one is going to be uh, doing status check. So um, we're just going to be doing basically a regular expression search and uh, uh, on the environment variable LMOD version. Basically, this, uh, this test, what it's supposed to do is testing the LMOD version. Uh, and you know you can, if you echo this variable, uh, you'll get the version of LMOD. So first, what I'd like you to do is, you know, run build test build on this. You're gonna find that probably there's gonna be a failure in the validation. So you would wanna, you know, run this, fix the uh, build spec, then apply the regular expression on the standard out. Um, Make sure that you know uh, you can. Then you can query the output. Um, once you know the output, you can try to apply the regular expression and make sure the test pass. So try to experiment with the regular expression. Um, try something that makes it fail, and then try something that makes it pass. Um, and if you if you if you get stuck, just look at the solution. Um, in every subdirectory, so there's going to be like an ex1, ex2, there is a dot solution file. Uh, the next one is a pretty simple exercise three is just querying the build spec cache. So uh, I know that we kind of covered this in the tutorial, um, but the idea is first just run this, and then you have seven things you have to do find the tags, list all the filter and format fields and all this stuff. So everything is gonna be um, kind of um, commands within build test, build spec. Just kind of exercising as you kind of understand how to use these commands. Uh, the fourth one is gonna be querying test report. So that is basically, you know, build test report. Um, you can look at this link. Uh, you wanna filter and format fields. So list all the filter and format fields, query by return code, zero, um, query all tests by tag name, E4S, and then you know print the total count of failed, failed tests. So I believe we talked about this in, uh, in, in the tutorial. Um, once you're done, upload the test results to C dash, so you can run this command and and then, yeah. Uh, actually, what you should see if you do this correctly is you should see something like this. And then if you want, you can take a look at the C dash link to see the test results. Um, but it's not really important. Uh, but yeah, uh, and this, this is the last exercise. So this is gonna be on performance check. So we have this uh, stream benchmark where we're capturing two metrics, copy and scale. And your task is to, um, well, first build it and run the inspect. Then um, use the greater and equal check on the copy and scale metric and pick some reference value. So this is a performance check. So um, you have to kind of run the test to see kind of what the performance uh, results are and try different reference values. Try some values that make the test fail and then try something that make it pass. So this is a assertion greater than. So if you, if you pick a really low value, obviously it's gonna pass, right? Um, and then try, try something high if you wanna make the test fail. So um, that's basically all there is for this exercise. Um, I guess I think maybe we could give about 40 minutes for see how it goes. Then maybe you guys can finish it quickly. 
Um, I'll try to give the solution at, yeah, about, I guess, 15 minutes prior to the session. How does that sound good? Any questions? All right, well, good luck. If you get stuck, please uh, please ask your questions in Slack where you can just unmute. Uh, Shasif, I have a question. Yeah. So I'm still catching up here, but I think I got to the point where I get to CD to build test root path and start with exercise uh, one. Um, the build spec code snippet, I'm assuming we need to add it to a file. Because if I just go and build the test, it won't work, right? Yeah, th th that uh, builds back. Yeah, yeah. I don't know where to put that. Yeah. Uh, so this is the exercise one hostname.yaml. 
so so yeah so you're supposed to i guess first you're supposed to run this which will run in a debug queue and then afterwards you can update this same test this ex1 hosting yaml okay let me see so if i if i run it first am i supposed to get errors no, you should actually get it to run. Okay, I think did, I did, tried. I think I did that. Let me check the command, the last command that I run. Uh, I think the last one I run is build test inspect query. Um, no, not that one, right? I should. I wasn't supposed to run that yet. Yet. Okay. And then I run the one before the build build. Hostname that YAML. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. I see what I did. I think I I run this the uh, inspect and that gave me an error. I wasn't supposed to do that just yet. Uh, I yeah. did it without modifying the the hostname that YAML. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's yeah. The the inspect uh, basically works on uh, assuming the test has run. So if you don't, if you haven't had the test run, then you're going to get an error with the build test inspect. So, okay. Yeah, that's what yeah. happened. Okay. Let me let me try and fix that. Thank you. Hey, Shazam. I've lost hey. build test somehow. You have lost build test? So it, it doesn't know. I mean, if I run build test, it says you can't find it. Oh, um, okay. Did you follow the instructions on installing build test in, in here? In where? In chat. Oh, sorry, not this one. Um, sorry, uh, this this is the one I'll put in the chat. But yeah, if you're going in the documentation, the first step right here is installing build tests. So um, so if you're if you're doing this on Perlmutter, yeah. Um, what you want to do is just module load Python. Yeah, I've done that. So and I have, have 3.9. Uh, All right. Okay. So then um, if you do like, if you do this, basically you should be able to get it to work. If you copy this. Um, and you source this script. This is uh, the main okay. script. That's what I lost. Yeah. That setup script. Uh, Let's build testing in your taller path, uh, installs all the dependencies. And then for this tutorial, once you're done with that, just make sure that you do this step of cloning this repository.
Okay, I am back on track. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Wow, that's good.
for the first exercise, if if it takes too long for the job to finish because of pending time, um, you can you can just control C out. Um, I just ran it. Um, I guess it took like for me like two hundred seconds for it to submit. So I can't really control how long the the job scheduler takes for it to run the job. Um, or you can do all the other exercises first and then do exercise one for last. <laughs> I don't know. The bad job just takes a while for the job to run. So if we cancel the the uh, build tests because it takes too long, can we still do the inspect query? Uh, you can, depending on which test. Act. Uh, well, it gave me an error. So I'm not sure if it's what it was because I just canceled the first the, the build test. Yeah, yeah. If if you cancel, then it's a it it will. So what happens is um um the the build test has to uh update the report file upon completion of the test. Um, but if you cancel, then nothing gets updated in the report file, and that's why. When you try to run like build test inspect query, if the test is not in the report file, then you're going to get an error. So, um, so yeah, I mean, you you can uh, you can just try it away. I, I think hopefully it should finish within, uh, you know, within two three minutes. Um, but if if you're able to successfully submit two jobs. Uh, that's okay. We we don't have to care if if the job actually ran to completion. Um, I think you you, you completed the task. So uh, if you do want to um, avoid having the job uh, run, you can use let's say this max pen time. Let's say like this, max pen time equals one twenty. And that could like terminate after like two minutes or so. Okay, that's useful. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah I was so able you... to to submit, so that that was good. It 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 fixed what you. Yeah, I was running inside the container. I didn't realize, uh, and that fixed the problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yeah, and I noticed there is an issue in exercise four. Um, I guess I'll, I, I found an error in their solution. So don't be alarmed.
Uh, just doing a quick check. How far are you guys coming along with the exercises? Um, was anyone able to get through all five of them? No, not yet. I think I spent too much time trying to, you know, set up the environment and then I didn't pay as much attention as I should have to the material itself. So I'm I'm looking for things as I am trying to solve the exercises. Okay. Larry and Sean, how are you guys doing? I'm still on exercise two. Okay. I'm but recovering. I <laughs> but don't worry about me. Yeah, I'm on okay. two as, as well. So I think yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to uh, make much progress because I had a, a lot of issues setting up my environment. It seems like it's good now, but um, yeah. Okay. Let's just say I'm I'm anxious yeah. to see the answers. <laughs> yeah, I, I went through and tried to do all the, the solutions myself. Um, Exercise three and four are a little bit easy. Um, one one probably takes probably the most time because the batch submission. So yeah, yeah, let me let me try one again. I mean, it was working, but I canceled it. So I'll do that just just for the sake of completion. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, feel free to. Do them. Um, I'll kind of show you the examples. So if y'all can see my screen, and so um, this is my solutions file. The the thing is that. You got to put in a regular expression and put in regular. Um, and there was already debug in there. Right. <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, if you didn't know the executors, you can do config executors, assuming you, you have your configuration set up and you would have seen that there is uh, a slurm regular right here, and there's one debug. <laughs> so that's what you had to do. Um, and then, you know, you would just run this like build test build. I Since this is gonna take some time, I'll just do pull interval equals maybe 10, max pen time equals 20. Most likely the job's not gonna finish within 20 seconds, but at least you'll get the idea. You see right here, there's two jobs running. It's dispatching them to the scheduler and now it's pending. Um, so just to demonstrate how bad submission works. And then, yeah. So that's basically all there was to do for exercise one. No, well, so with max pen time, it it cancels the job, but if there's other jobs running, you will obviously run them to completion. Okay. 
Um, for exercise two, it was a little tricky. Uh, first of all, the, the, the test was invalid. So what you have to first do is you can run build spec validate dash B module version by YAML. And you're getting, you're going to get this error. Um, script compiler scat or spec is one of the supported schemas. Um, actually the typo is that this was an executors with an S needs to be without the S. So that was one fix. And then the other is we needed to fix this. Uh, this type needs to be fixed to script. So the solution is, I guess first you fix that, and then there, and then you apply the regular expression. So the version of L mod is eight three one, and we apply this on standard L. So you can do echo L mod version. And that's the version that we have. And if I run this like this, it's going to work. IT query dash show. Now you see there the versions 8.1 is there. And if you want to make it fail, let's say 8.3.2. You run it again, now it will fail. So that was what the exercise two is supposed to do. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, for exercise three, it was just scoring the build spec cache. This was basically, just knowing what commands to run. So I just kind of wrote down all the commands that you had to do, but um, you had to make sure you ran, you run this command first to rebuild the build spec cache, otherwise it won't um, work. So the first one to query tags is, is just run this, double dash tags uh, to show filter and format fields is help format, help filter. Uh, to format tables by name and description, you just specify name and description as uh, options to the format. For number four, to filter by tags, E4S, you just say, um, you know, tags as the key and then uh, and the value, which is the tag name. Uh, to show invalid build specs, that's just find invalid. Uh, if you want to validate build specs by tag name, you can use build test build spec validate dash T E for us. And then if you want to show the content of this test, you use build spec show. So I wrote this into a shell script so that you could just like run it to make sure everything works. So this is all the tags. It's the uh, filter format, format fields. This is the all the build specs for E4S. Um, this is all the invalid build specs. Or sorry, those are the E4S ones. These are all the invalid build specs. And show validating all the E4S build specs. That's this. And then this is showing the step seven, which is the content of hello world open MP. Okay. Uh, exercise four should be also pretty simple. Um, it's just knowing how to use build test report. But build test report help filter and help format. That's um, the uh, number one, listing the filter and format fields. 
to query by return code, you just say return code equals zero uh, to filter by tags. It's just built as report filter tags equals E for us. And to show row count, it's built test report double dash fail row count. So, you know, if I run this, <clears throat> that's the filter fields, format fields. And these are all the tests queried by um, I believe. Yeah. I guess we probably didn't we yeah, we probably didn't run. So there is a typo. We probably need to change the tag name. That was kind of what the error was. Um build test report. Uh there was no tag name to be for us. Um, but yeah. Okay. Um, I guess if you run the build test C dash, what this should do is you you run this and you get this link. And you can open this up. Uh open selection as URL. Yeah. And now if you see this, this is all the tests that have uh, been uploaded to C dash. Okay. So you see 38 tests have passed, 18 have failed. Note that this is exactly what you would have gotten if you had to run, you know, uh, row count. You know, those are those 38 tests that have passed and you can see all those tests right here. And, um, you know, if you dig, dig deep into one of these tests and what they're doing, I don't know, like sleep, you're going to see the test results uh, for every single one. Yeah, so it's so it's pretty cool. Um, you can, I don't know, what is it? Oh, yeah, show command line. Yeah, you can see that. So, uh, and then like for the fun, some of the failure tests, yeah, you can see that here too. So like here, here's the test style mod version, whatever. Oh, yeah, like I ran this with, a different regular expression, and then it failed. Um, okay, so let's go back. Exercise five was um, more of a kind of a tr um, trial and error, uh, just trying to uh, try a different reference value um, with stream benchmark. So it it so let's let's go to that exercise five. But first, you could just run the build. Um, oh, no. Oh, so let, since I'm already in the directory, I just need to do stream .yaml. So yeah, if I run the benchmark and you just do build test um, inspect query patch o. You're gonna see the, ben uh, typically this is kind of the output that you get from a stream. You get these functions, copy, scale, add, and try add, and you get these, uh, you know, this best rate, um, average time, minimum time, maximum time. And uh, the metrics that you see here are the copy and scale. They are actually reading uh, this first column right here. And um, the task was to, basically um, use a cert greater than to um, basically check uh, the performance results. So what we did is I just uh, used values like 1200 and 1400 uh, because I got performance of about 15 and 16,000. So I ran this and now you know, um, the, the, the test uh, ran to completion uh, with the status check. Um, then, you know, you could, if you want, you can try this with, 
let's say another value, let's say 20,000. And hopefully this will fail now. And yeah, so there you go. This test fails. So you notice that when one of the status check fails, the, uh, the at least a greater equal check is gonna fail because it's a list of assertions. Uh, so yeah. So that's it. That was this dire exercise. Could you show the answer to number two again, please? Yeah, um, this is the one. So there you have to put this. Yeah. And you have to put this. The regular expression, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So there's so so what you what you explained to us today is a test harness right called build test. Mm -hmm. And I know because I I hope my parameter account is still alive, but I had one uh, to test a frame uh, a, a reframe or a test harness based on reframe. And I know internally here at AMD we're we're using something else and. When I was with Intel, we were using yet another one. Can you can you explain? Uh, first of all, this one looks really nice, um, very intuitive. Um, I see it has its integration with SPAC. What what else would you say sets this apart, and what why would you use it in, uh, in, in instead of reframe, for example, which you also have at, at, uh, at NERSC mm -hmm. in Permuter? Um, I guess there's some things that are um, kind of unique in terms of build tests. One is um, there's a, I guess, ability to, um, you know, you can, um, you uh, for instance, you can do, um, there's a more powerful functionality of like, let's say querying test results, um, you know, test runs. Uh, you have the ability to um, publish test results to CDASH. Um, I don't think Reframe has um, something like that, but you know, you can Reframe as um, plugins to push to like, um, you know, gray log and uh, like syslog and stuff like that. Uh, C-Dash works quite well for us here um, within the ECP project because we can publish test results. And a lot of teams in ECP are using that too. Um, I think, um, yeah, some of the, like, the other features that are, I mean, that are kind of, well, more easier, what I would say, you know, um, is the ability to, um, you know, validate build specs um and searching the build specs like knowing what tests are available um i don't think reframe has that i right? like if uh, and then you know being able to query what's available and uh, all the tests that are available and you know so i mean uh reframe and build tests are very similar in the sense of how they build um but yeah so if we want to give it a try, we just follow the steps in the tutorial, right? And integrate, we can integrate our own tests in our own machines. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, the one key difference between um, build tests um, and like reframe is, you know, we're writing tests in YAML in um, build tests, which is, uh, declarative YAML syntax, which can be, it's pretty easy to do. 
Um, YAML is used extensively in like in almost lots of lots of tools out there, like configuration management tools, like Ansible, even like Docker, Kubernetes. Um, you know, um, but then uh, Reframe is mostly um, tests are written in Python. So you need to have Python background. Um, yes. So uh, I did mention this, but if there is a documentation now, am I sharing my screen? Yeah, I am. Yeah, if you, uh, this explains about how you, you can use built tests um, at an HPC site, but I mean, if you're starting out and you have no, like, you don't know, like, what, what, what to do, I mean, definitely you want to, you want to read this page, but the idea is, like, you got to pick some version of build test to use. Uh, typically, I would, I would stick to a master branch, uh, or if you're okay with a, a moving bleeding edge develop, then you can do that too. And what uh, I think we'll talk about in the next section is you want to have a, you want you want to have a repository where you can actually start writing your tests. So you know you can take a look at our build test nurse repo and start configuring build tests. So so yeah. And how about you know once the test outputs their results and the figures of merit. The way we would do it manually or traditionally is we would have to write yet more scripts to parse the output and, you know, determine if the test passed or failed or, you know, if, if the figure of merit is the variability is within range or not. How, how do you handle that with, with the build test? Um, well, I think what, I think there's different types of obviously performance checks, um, like that you would have to definitely take into account, um, if it's a range of tests, I mean, definitely, uh, we covered some of these, but, you know, you know, you have different comparison operators, depending on what type of test you're doing, right? We talked about a cert greater than equal to. Right, uh, there is a cert range. Um, you got to run all your tests, and typically uh, we're kind of going a little bit ahead, but uh, we have all of this stuff run automatically, and we push all the test results to C dash, and so, and then so we kind of see the history of all the tests there. So we don't have to write. Full, full scripts to parse the output of the test, right? We can still use this mm -hmm. declarative uh, yeah. constructs. Okay. I mean, that saves yeah. a lot, a lot, a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, the, the the status uh, so yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, the status Keyword, we talked about many different types of return uh, checks. If you don't have status, it's assumed the script is just going to run, and it's just a zero return code is a pass, right? Um, and that that works well. Uh, but then you know, if if you have some output and you're like, okay, well, um, I want to check if if some value in the in the output. Then you know you can you can do regular expression search. You can do runtime check. Uh, you can do any of these performance check. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of different stuff. Um, if you want to write your own script, I think you can do that too. Um, but like I might. Check. I don't. I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> if yeah. I can help it, if I, if I can help it, I don't want to. But you know, just in. It just as needed, right? Yeah, th there are a few additional features. Uh, one, one of um, well, let me see. Uh, where was this? 
this was under, oh yeah, this was under the build spec tutorial overview test status. So uh, this file check was a pretty recent feature. Um, what, uh, one, of, one of the users had requested, I want to check for file, uh, I'm going to pre-create files and check for existence. And then we're like, okay, we'll do existence. We'll do uh, also checks for if it's a directory and file. And then another one that just came up that we don't have support yet is for like symlinks. But uh, another feature that um, this user wanted to check was uh, I'm going to create um, like X number of files with certain extension files. And I wanted to see if that number of like account of those files exists in this directory. So, um, so it's like that's one feature that we'll probably we try to add. Um, but yeah, there's stuff like this that we're going to periodically add, but basically all of this stuff will go into the status check. Um, yeah. Um, I realize we're, um, we, we, we should take a break because I want to give you guys um, a little bit of time um, and we'll, we can wrap up because we're, we're probably about 45 minutes ahead. Um, why don't we do that and come back at like uh, 12 minutes, I guess, what's it, 4, 4 p.m. Central time. Is that okay? Let me pause the video. Resume recording. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, and so how does it work? We uh, use uh, GitLab CI CD uh, via schedule pipelines on the bottom, um, right? You see different pipelines that we trigger uh, for a subset of tests. Uh, we use a custom uh, GitLab runner um, using Jackamore. Uh, to run basically tests uh, via a single user account. And then all of our tests are using the devel branch of build tests. Uh, we intentionally use devel uh, because uh, we're, you know, we're just using the bleeding edge uh, uh, you know, uh, features of build tests. So that way, if there's any uh, additional function, uh, features that we have, we can basically make use of it, but also more importantly, if there's bugs in the build test code, we're not you know, tied to uh, a new release. We always can just fix it quickly. Um, you know, that may not be suitable for uh, everyone. You may wanna just pick a master version if you want more st stability. Uh, where do the test get published? Well, it's at CDash uh, at this link uh, over here. And yeah, let's see. So C, uh, so build test has integration with CDash. Um, CDash produces all these pretty color uh, coded charts, uh, timelines, even links to test output. And it's very comprehensible um, uh, presentation of test results. Um, you know, on the web, and then you know, it's it's really helpful for uh, our end users and even ECP teams to be able to kind of view the test results for some of these uh, tests that we're running. You can track progress over time. So this this is just a feature of C Dash, nothing to do with build tests. But you know, if you go and you open up a, uh, these filters, uh, you can say like the site. Uh, specify the name of the site, um, like Perlmutter, and then the build name. Uh, you can then press filter based on like start and end dates, and then it will give you all the, the test results filtered. So like you can see, we were running uh, many types of, uh, like basically many sets of tests and almost uh, over the span of a month, uh, we get uh, several entries. Um, so this, uh, so our CI/CD pipeline, the way it looks like, 
is that we have the schedule pipeline. You can press play. Uh, if you want to run it manually, or you could just let the event trigger the pipeline, it will trigger a, a, a job, a GitLab job. Um, at the end, it will upload the results to CDash, where you get this link, and then this link gets published, and, and then all the test results are there. Um, we also get notification in the Slack channel when the tests uh, publish, um, but we, we mostly just only getting notification when there is a failure. Um, and then typically what we do is then we just kind of take a look at the test results after the tests have been published and then see um, you know, what the failures are basically. Um, so I'm gonna give you size, uh, just some example, real example tests that we have. Um, this first example is HDF5. So uh, Larry, yeah, this that's you. <laughs> uh, but th thanks for your contribution. So we're using one of the HDF5 tests for SPAC test. This is one one of the one of the examples that we have, and we're testing this on E4S 2111. Um, so you know what we uh, what we're using is we're using the SPAC schema, um, and we're gonna be you know uh, we load the E4S module, E4S 2111 module, and then we use back load uh, on one of the HDF5 specs, and then we try to do spec test run and results. And then, you know, on the right is kind of the the, the test results for uh, HDF5. So, um, so we have a lot of different tests like this uh, for spec test um, uh, enabled, like, you know, build test ones. Uh, for different products. Um, some products work uh, automatically and then others just don't. Uh, this is also another example, also credit to Eric for contributing um, this. Uh, this is a, basically a simple Amrex uh, single vortex test that runs on GPU on one of our E4S installations. Um, so it's basically, uh, Let's say a CMake build of um, uh, you know Amorex and running an S run on the single vortex application, and then the end of the output, it's um, going to give you a finalized, the very last line, and that's what we're using for the regular expression search and and yeah, and it does some calculation. Uh, this is also another contribution from one of our, um, the team. Uh, I guess um, I think he would join the session, but then he left. Um, I think it's John uh, from Live Ensemble team. So in this team, they had two different types of tests. Um, uh, one Live Ensemble test um, that was local MPI, and another one that was GPU one. So what they did is they just wrote uh, a simple script like uh, this run 1D sampling local MPI.sh, and then on the bottom, uh, this is the script. Basically, it's just doing a module load of SPAC E4S, and then uh, their SPAC load PyLib Ensemble, and then they run uh, a Python script. Uh, the, the source code is provided in the repo, and, and then the output is, Apparently, there's just only one output. It just says check some past. So uh, that's what the test is doing. Uh, and I think this is another one of the tests. But yeah, we're testing Cocos uh, from E4S test suite. So uh, why I talked about how to do this. So um, we module load E4S, um, SPAC environment activity, one of the environments. Um, so we have multiple environments. So GCC is one of them. And in order to run some of the um, E4S test suite, uh, typically it requires CMake for some of the tests. So we make sure that we load CMake. And, and then we just run the test suite. 
Um, and then this is kind of what the test output looks like um, at the end. It, I mean, it's kind of doing a hello world through Fortran, but there's some other calculations being done too. Um, yeah, so I think um, But, um, so in build test nurse, this is our repo. And, and if you want to get involved, um, you know, we have an open issue uh, form for this project. Um, and we also have a dedicated Slack channel where we keep track of all the, um, the bugs. Um, so I'll briefly show a little demo of how this works. Um, this is our project right here. And we have, um, let's say, yeah, so actually there's a pipeline running right now. And so, yeah, so this one is actually running a test, uh, E4S test, the, the tag name. You see build test build dash T tag name. Um, so this tag name is, uh, the way we have, we have set this up is we have defined a variable tag name that uh, is in each of our scheduled pipelines and it will run. So if you go into scheduled pipelines, we have a bunch of these. And if you click edit and you see reveal values, uh, we have defined this tag name uh, right here. And that's what the tag name is used to define uh, you know, build test build dash t, what tag name you want to use. So we have e4s here, uh, like another one right here. This is GPU test, and this one a GPU. So if you click on, let's say, one of these pipelines, uh, I guess, yeah, and then I guess the Cori ones we have. The system name is Corey. Okay. And if you want to press, if you want to just run any pipeline, you just go and, you know, you could just press play again. So, um, yeah. And then these test results, where is it? They get published right here. to this repo. And now you see all of these, um, you know, recent runs of those tests. So that's how uh, we have our setup um, where we use GitLab to automate all of our uh, uh, tests build tests the just used as a driver to run those tests on the HPC systems. And you see it to monitor the test results. It's kind of just puts everything in, uh, in one place. So, and then when you, when you have um, C dash here, uh, then what potentially what you can do is you can then start setting up, um, I don't know, some kind of, uh, you know, mechanism for you to kind of monitor these at some cadence and try to, you know, um, actively fix issues. So we try to do it every two weeks. We meet and then we fix ish issues by opening up issues for bug failures, uh, like basically anything that fails and then try to, you know, address them, right? So we find, we're trying to look at why they fail and then see what's wrong and then, you know, and then make uh, proper uh, corrections. So, um, yeah. So that was a brief uh, demo of um, build test nurse. Oh, maybe I should at least show you um, so if you, if you think of having some kind of, um, so we have GitLab, um, you can use any CI CD um, you want, 
but um, you know, the way our GitLab CI file, it's it's pretty pretty simple, but we've had it in a way where we, you know, we have like one job right here. Uh, like let's say this Corey scheduled task. Um, you know, we're doing this build test build on this tag name where the tag name is defined in the schedule pipeline. And then, you know, we're just running build test C dash upload and we're just showing the report failure. So like this is all the tests that run on Corey. Uh, it's using this tag name Corey right here, Corey for us. So uh, one th if, if you know a little bit of GitLab, um, all of our pipelines are only run on schedule. So that's what this session section is doing. Uh, we don't run anything on push commits. Um, so yeah, and it's pretty easily configurable. We can change the schedule pipeline to whatever uh, interval we want. So, so yeah. Um, I guess that's about it. And I guess if you need help with build tests, I mean, I think all of you have already joined the Slack channel. Um, but you know, if you if you have a feature in mind, obviously, um, please you know open up an issue in uh, the GitHub issue tracker. Uh, you can also post a discussion in the in the discussions. Um, link right there um, and obviously if, if you if you're a first time contributor you know you can please see the contribution guide uh, you know please fork um, the repo if you're going to contribute and if you like build tests to start the repo um, and yeah I hope you enjoy the session uh, these are the references um, and that's it I do want to give you guys uh, some things if you didn't know in the documentation. Um, if you're starting out with build tests, there is this quick start guide. Pretty helpful if you just want to get a quick, quick way of learning what build test is. Um, I guess when you get into configuring build tests, you know, please do take a look at what is this. Uh, section right here, uh, how to configure build tests. Yeah, this one. This section will talk a, a lot about how you configure build tests. Um, and I would say probably the best thing to look at is actually our configuration file that 